I guess y'all can hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, good morning. Looks like everyone has already taken their seats. Um, members, I'm just going to make you aware that we've got a new mic system. It's the first time we've been in this room. So every, every mic up here and down there is hot. So just be mindful of the things that you are saying. I'll just tell Mr. Hidalgo, Mr. Boober, it looks like y'all uh, y'all lucked out on the chairs. You got some plush recliners. Looks like you just need a remote in your hand and you'd be set. Uh, so if I could get uh, Miss Inger to please call the roll. Chairman Klein. Here. Mr. Lovell. Charles Roulette for Lovell. Mr. Landry. Here. Mr. Myers. Mr. Tusa. Here. Mr. Witte. Here. Mr. Bro. Here. Ms. Goodson. Here. Mr. Broussard. Ms. Dayries. Here. Mr. Ince. Ms. Gotro. Mr. Burke. Here. Ms. Gorman. Here. Mr. Bubrick. Here. Mr. Bourgeois. Here. Mr. Hidalgo. Here. Ms. Cormier. Here. Mr. Segrera. Here. President McGinnis. Here. Representative Zarain. On his Sen way. Yeah. Senator Henskins. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Singer. Yes, ma'am. We do have with us today uh, Representative Ray Garofalo in attendance, sitting as a board member. Uh, if you could just make note of that for the record, uh, please, Inger. And with that, members, we're going to uh, now uh, call up St. Tammany Parish President Mr. Mike Cooper uh, for some welcoming remarks. Uh, members, I believe this is the first board meeting we've had here in St. Tammany. A lot of thing, exciting things happening on the North Shore, and um, it's great to be here in St. Tammany Parish, Mr. President. Good morning and welcome, uh, honored board uh, of commissioners for CPRA. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we're happy to host uh, this monthly meeting of CPRA here at the council chambers in St. Tammany Parish. Uh, I want to recognize a few people too. I can't see behind me, so I'm going to have to turn. There are elected officials here representing St. Tammany Parish. I uh, see Representative Mary Duzon, our state representative here this morning. Anybody else from the state? I see two ladies in the back. Uh, Noble, Noble Bates Young, representing state Senator, Senator McMath, Patrick McMath. Samantha Bopp, representing U.S. Senator Bill Cassidy. And we have parish council members here this morning. Councilman Jimmy Davis representing the Lacombe area and Parish Councilman sorry, walk in, Jake Airy representing District 13 in the Slidell area. Are there any other elected officials in here this morning? So, and I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, I see familiar faces from uh, all industries, but particularly those interested in, in coastal restoration and flood protection, uh, not only in our parish, but, but uh, in, our, in our area. So St. Tammany Parish is the fourth largest parish in Louisiana. Uh, the 2020 census showed us that 264,570, and we continue to grow. Our sales tax revenue is healthy and continues to grow. Well, we have a two cent sales tax that's dedicated solely for infrastructure, roads, bridges, drainage, maintenance of our Tammany Trace. And uh, our top parish, we're the top parish in Louisiana for median income at $66,000, 66,000 annual income. And our unemployment rate at this time is 2.7%. So I took office in 
January of 2020. I'm not going to give you a three-year history of what happened in the last three years. But one thing that was evident then and even before then was that our growth was outpacing our infrastructure. And I know that may be happening in, in other areas as well. And some attention was given to flood protection and coastal restoration, but we have taken steps to, to increase that. And I'll uh, shortly turn that over to uh, Randy Barsina to give you an update on the coastal uh, work that we're doing here in St. Tammany Parish. But investing in infrastructure is important. We're investing in roads, bridges, drainage, and public works with new projects and maintenance of existing uh, infrastructure. We're utilizing our two cent sales tax uh, for that infrastructure, but we're also seeking capital outlay money and have been successful with that. And also seeking DOTD, help from DOTD, RPC, and of course federal grants. But we're also, we're also have planning initiatives underway while we're addressing our infrastructure needs and the, the fast growth that we're experiencing. We've just completed and adopted a comprehensive plan update. It was uh, 20 years in the making. Uh, we've uh, called it New Directions 2040. And currently underway, we have a, uh, the first comprehensive parish-wide drainage plan, uh, low impact development guidebook, a wetlands plan and policy guidebook, and an update of our unified development code, which are our codes for developing and, and building, and soon to get started, a parish-wide multimodal transportation plan. Uh, we're very proud of the uh, steps that we've taken for, for infrastructure and planning uh, to address the needs of our citizens. And shortly after taking office, we realized that uh, we had federal funding coming in through GOMESA. And like some of the other parishes, we took advantage of bonding out the, that annual revenue uh, in 2020 to the tune of $25 million in projects uh, that uh, were identified in the, in the coastal plan. And we prioritize those projects and have many underway at this time. Uh, before I call uh, Randy uh, Pausina up to the, to the stand to, uh, to give an update on those projects uh, during this welcome, uh, I just want to thank uh, the partnership that we have with CPRA and the participation that you've provided to us, uh, particularly over the last three years, Mr. Chairman and, and board members. Uh, it's uh, the help and assistance that you've provided is uh, immeasurable, and we certainly appreciate that. So at this time, I'm going to call uh, our coastal protection and what's your full title? Coastal Protection and Restoration Manager, Randy Pausina. <laughs> Uh, to give an update on some of those GOMESA projects that we have. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. thanks for coming here. I, I love to hear that this is your first trip here because when I started here, part of my agenda, so to speak, was we are a coastal parish. And most people don't see Ta St. Tammany as a coastal parish. And we wanted to hit the ground, make a big splash, and, and get y'all's attention. It looked like it worked. It took three years, a little less than three <laughs> years. Thank you for coming. Thank you to all of y'all for coming. So as you know, we have Go Mesa Parish, Go Mesa Money. Um, three years ago, we had perhaps two, I think it was about $3.2 million in the bank. And as President Cooper said, um, with great vision, he immediately bonded it out. And you can't do a whole $3.2 million is a lot of money. You can't do a whole lot of projects with it. Immediately turned it into over $25 million. I'm going to walk through a bunch of the coastal projects that we've kind of unleashed with all of our partners, the Corps, the uh, St. Tammany Levy District, CPRA, um, you know, anybody we can work with. Um, again, we turned our 3.2 into $25 million. We tried to spread our projects all across St. Tammany, east to west, north to south. Um, here at the foot of the uh, Trafunta River, you know there's a historic lighthouse. We're putting a protective, we're going to protect that peninsula with a rock jetty. We, we also put a jetty out and, and going to add a uh, dock so people can actually go visit that. 
Just across the pass, um, we're going to put a protective breakwater in. Um, if you're familiar with the area, you know there's a big high-use uh, public boat launch at the end of the, um, the river there, and this levy will help, obviously help with storm surge and tidal action, but it'll also protect those people that are launching, and it'll also provide some protection for the lighthouse because predominantly in this area, it's a southeast wind constantly beating up um, on the south end of uh, Madisonville. And then the next project, all in that same area, the peninsula in the middle of the two green areas, that's actually where the lighthouse is, and we're going to look at doing some marsh nourishment, maybe some terracing, or perhaps sand nourishment in that area to kind of fill in those coves as well. Uh, moving to the east a little bit, we have a partnership with the city of Mandeville. And you can see that's one of the only areas in Mandeville that's not armored. And you can see how the erosion's pushing it back. Um, this is just a little schematic of, of what the partnership Mandeville is trying to do and, and, the, and the parish as well is to um, do some marsh creation and then put a protective berm out in front. All right, and then of course we have this gem of our, our other partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, <laughs> a big branch wildlife refuge, and oh, I got a point. I forgot about that. You can see this side here it takes a, a beating from that southeast wind. Over here, it actually builds sand. So we're in the in the midst of a feasibility and de design to look at building living shorelines here. Don't put a big up wall. We don't want to put a big wall up to protect the shoreline. We want to do something more in tune with nature. And of course, we can't grow oysters here like they can all over the state, so we have to be um, creative. So we just finished a feasibility study on that. We're going to design and we hope to um, go to construction, do a demonstration, some demonstration freshwater type living shoreline projects real soon. Um, and that's, that's Pensacola. I know the um, NOAA restoration folks did a really wonderful view. If you take the scenic route to Florida and you go through Pensacola, you can, right before you get onto the bridge, you can look over to your right and there's a beautiful uh, Living Shorelines project there that we're trying to mimic. Um, this is off of E. Niles. Um, we have a, we just finished the coastal processes or modeling study to put a breakwater in out in front of E. Niles. If you remember back to Katrina, E. Niles got hit with a lot of debris as the storm left and the water was coming out the lake. So we're hoping if we could put some breakwater out there, it would stop um, that debris from clobbering E. Niles area. Um, this is just a little schematic. Moving up, you know, with GoMesa, you can do restoration protection projects, but you can also do rec use projects. We have two boat launches further up on the Pearl that are high use. Uh, they access the river, they access saltwater, freshwater fishing, they access recreational boating, and um, state and federal wildlife refuge areas. Um, but at the mouths of both of these launches where they enter into the Pearl, they continue to silt in. So for this one, we're going to dredge it out and put some sheet pile. This is the Davis Canal restoration. And then the second one is the Pearl River Navigation Canal, um, where we're looking at putting, doing the same thing, dig out the end so that the boats can get in and out, particularly in the winter when it's water's really low, and then put some rocks there to kind of keep the sediment from filling in. Moving right along. Um, lock one is, is, is a really beautiful um, place if you've never been there, it's, it's, the, it's the bottom lock of the old Pearl River Diversion Canal or Navigation Canal, and it's a beautiful area. We kind of share with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, it has two boat launches there that were in need of some upgrades and the parking as well. So the north launch, which is pictured here, um, we're putting in a new ramp. It accesses basically a seven mile recreational lake, that part of the canal, real, real high use area. And on the south side, there's a, oops, excuse me, there's a launch as well that we're going to replace and redo some of the parking. And that's the one that leads right out into the Pearl. Extreme high use areas. Um, Salt Bayou Marsh Creation, um, we're looking at, this is a design only project. It's a big project, $1.2 million design. I think we're also in cooperation with CPRA for a coastal partnership um, grant to uh, add some more money to that um, and to have this shovel-ready project available. We hope to have that done in the next year as a design, fully shovel-ready to go. And um, some big money comes along, we'll have a project to go. It's, it's, it's kind of like our Macy's on the block. This will be our big shovel-ready project. 
and it's lower Fritchie Marsh in this area. We're looking at this area and this area up here, um, but it's critical to the water that comes in on the east side of Slidell. And Car Drive, also, we're just doing a feasibility study on Car Drive. Uh, if you're familiar with how the levied areas of Slidell drain, they, they, they drain into a canal that runs straight down to the lake. So the only way for the water that's pumped out of the levees into this canal to get out to the lake is down the canal. But if the end of the canal gets silted in by a storm, surge, debris, what have you, there's only two outlets for that water. And there's two bridges, two rail, there's a railroad track that runs in. There's two bridges that go underneath it. So this is the lower one. And the idea is if we could dredge it out, keep it open as an emergency, we could also use dredge that canal out and it would allow the water to flow through here without tearing up the marsh and then use that beneficial spoil to fill in the areas in that marsh, which would be right here. All right. And then finally, I believe is um, there is a fishing pier in Slidell and this is a project to put a public free launch and clean up the area um, right next to where that fishing pier is, another rec use project in Slidell. Uh, also, Restore Act, um, I think, uh, you know, three years ago we got here and there were $2.3 million in Restore Act in funds. I think we're about halfway through that payout. It's a 15 year payout. I think at the end, St. Tammany's portion is $6.2 million. So good news, about two weeks ago, we had our plan approved by um, US Treasury. And the plan is materials opportunity. Right now, we're submitting the projects to get funded. And, and the way, the, the, the path we decided to go in St. Tammany's materials opportunities. So you see that list there, concrete. So on your way here, you, you know that we have a pretty major um, I-12 widening project. Piles of concrete everywhere. Called them up and they've been delivering that project to some of our yards and we're holding it. So the, the whole goal here is to find materials in our parish to reuse in our parish towards our Go Mesa coastal restoration projects. Um, whether it's crushing glass in the sand, whether it's concrete, whether it's the end supply ditch dirt that we have, Christmas trees, of course. Uh, if we could ever find a, a use for tires, we'd be, we'd be millionaires, right? Um, <laughs> and then, of course, woody items. There's always storm debris and woody items. Um, and of course, I know y'all going to give us a, a talk on this later, so I won't delve, delve too much on it. But again, I believe the first week uh, President Cooper was in office, he signed um, the papers to get this project moving, which is the St. Tammany um, Core Feasibility Study, which is unbelievable, you know, thing to happen to St. Tammany. $4.2 billion in the tentatively selected plan. 1.8 of it is in levies, 1.8 billion in levies in South and West Slidell. 28 million is the mile branch dredging up here. Um, and then there's some channel improvements. That's that little red dot right here as well. And then non-structural $2.2 billion in home raisings or commercial waterproofing. Um, but there's also some more good news with that. Um, there were some areas that we wanted the Corps to take a better look at, the Military Road area, Eden Isles, look at some different alignments in, in the Lacombe area. And so they granted us a 16 month extension as well as added $1.8 million to the project. Um, wonderful, wonderful thing for St. Tammany. And then finally, um, just uh, several months ago at the RPC, the Regional Planning Commission, um, President Cooper authored a resolution that is asking the Corps and Congress, CPRA, um, everybody to take another look at the Lake Pontchartrain Barrier Project. You know, it's been around since the 50s, 60s. It's in the state master plan. Uh, and that's all we're basically asking. Uh, I think we, we, you know, it passed unanimously at the RPC. Two letters were sent, one to Congress saying, hey, let's restart, re let's restart um, this project. Let's take a look at it. Also, we sent some, uh, a letter to UNO, to the PRP at UNO, to um, possibly get some funding of the $53 million that are line item for Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation through the infrastructure bill, and we could start doing some modeling. Um, so this is a project that it's really a no-brainer. It's really complicated and really expensive, but it's a no-brainer. No Everybody behind that wall gets treated equally, regardless of what parish, what economic income, or where you live, 
around Lake Pontchartrain. If that wall's up, you're going to be protected. It just makes for redundancy to all the other projects that are already done and all the other levees that are around the lake. We estimate that the damage reduction could be in the, in the order of one, low, you know, $1.2, $1.4 billion. And of course, it includes flood walls, levees, and gates. No locks this time, just gates. <laughs> Similar to St. Bernard. All right, I think that's all I got. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paulson. It's always great to get an update on how parishes are using their um, local revenues to invest in projects that are either in the coastal master plan or complementary with or consistent with uh, the master plan. And so there's a lot of great work here. I want to commend you, President Cooper, because I feel that St. Tammany Parish over the last several years has really stepped up its game when it comes to the overall restoration and protection of the North Shore. So you are be to be commended uh, for that effort. And thank you again for your for your hospitality here this morning. So, thank you all. Yes, thank sir. You very thank much. you, Mr. Thank President. You. All right, members. Well, if we could take a look at the agenda. I don't have any changes to the agenda at this time. I have a motion to approve a motion by Ms. Gorman, a second by Ms. Cormier. Uh, to approve the agenda. Any public comment, any objections to that motion? Motion carries. Approval of the minutes. Inger sent those minutes, uh, I believe, yesterday. A motion by Ms. Goodson to approve the minutes. A second by Ms. Cormier. Any public comments? Any objection to the motion? Motion is approved. Any old business or announcements from board members? Okay. Moving on to agenda item number seven. A 2022 year in review. Members, this is our last board meeting of the year. Um, not, not only is it our last board meeting, members, but we are heading into the final year of this administration. And so I want to begin this presentation by just thanking all of you for your continued service on this board. Um, the work that you have done over the last several years has undoubtedly helped us get to where we are in the coastal program today. And um, it helps us that work at CPRA. It makes our job a lot easier having a strong and supportive board that we do. So I just want to express my appreciation and thanks to all of you for your continued service. And, you know, from, from time to time, I think it's important to reflect on where we've come from, where we are as a coastal program, uh, and where we are going. And this has been an incredible monumental year for the state's coastal program. Members, I just asked you to look at these statistics. And we put these on a lot of the presentations that we do, but sometimes I don't think we truly reflect on what these statistics mean. 70 miles of barrier island restoration since 2007. 70 miles. That's like getting in your car and driving from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Lacombe, Louisiana. 369 miles of levees have been built or improved since 2007. Get in your car and drive from Baton Rouge to Birmingham, Alabama, just to get your head around that statistic. 55,000 acres of new land has been built or improved, utilizing 190 million cubic yards of material. 190 million cubic yards will fill the New Orleans Superdome 42 times. And over $20 billion has been secured that goes towards the restoration and protection of coastal Louisiana. And this year alone, some of the largest coastal restoration projects, largest marsh creation projects in the history of the state's coastal program are now under construction. The largest number of dredging projects. You've heard Bryn, you've heard me, you've heard other people in CPRA talk about the fact that this is the year of the dredge. Over 60% of the dredges in the Gulf of Mexico fleet are doing coastal restoration work in South Louisiana. Just over 20% of the dredges in the entire fleet of dredges in this country are doing coastal restoration work in South Louisiana. Over $120 million in additional revenue that has been secured with the support of Chairman Zerang, other members of the Louisiana Le Legislature, Representative Dubuchon is here with the support of the governor. Close to $3 billion in additional federal funding will be coming to fund coastal restoration and hurricane protection projects over the next several years. Many projects that have literally been envisioned for years, members, were completed 
this past year. And so while we focus on building projects, constructing projects, there's also been a lot of policy accomplishments over the last several years. In June of next year, there will actually be a lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico for wind energy. And that effort has been led by the governor's coastal office in petitioning the Department of Interior, looking at the feasibility of having wind energy produced in the Gulf of Mexico. The state of Louisiana this year passed its first climate action plan, which gets us to net carbon zero by 2050, one of its kind from a deep south state. If you go to Washington, D.C., and you meet with a member of the Biden administration, I guarantee you they will reference this plan. It is incredible how well positioned the state of Louisiana is for IIJA money, for Inflation Reduction Act money, because of the way we are approaching climate resilience and climate adaptation in this state. And it's something that we should all be very proud of. We had 12 state agencies this year complete a resilience report card to look into how their efforts, their mission overlays with the coastal mission and their vulnerabilities from storm surge and land loss, which has been led by Charles Sutcliffe in our office. We got a National Estuary and Research Reserve uh, Award or designation for the Atchafalaya Basin, which has been several years in the making. And we have had substantial federal funding. Last year at this time, at our last board meeting, I believe Southwest Coastal had about $300,000 allocated to it. Southwest Coastal today has close to $300 million for home elevations in an area that was battered during the 2020 hurricane season from Hurricane Laura and Delta. And members, I would point you to the Water Resource Development Act that is hopefully gonna be passed at the end of this year. I am not aware of another piece of federal legislation probably since word of 2007 that has more policy provisions in it for the state of Louisiana. If, if you look at what's included in that bill that is about to be approved or reported out from the conference committee, Upper Barataria authorized, South Central authorized, the third and final payment for the Hisdris system around the greater New Orleans is kicked out 10 years and gives us time to negotiate with the Corps of Engineers on crediting provisions. The Mississippi River Gulf outlet, Mr. Go, the restoration, the $2 billion restoration that was done in and around the St. Bernard area by that channel. There's a provision in the word of bill that it is 100%, 100% of the cost is borne by the federal government. The Lower Mississippi River Management Study, a comprehensive study to look at how the Corps of Engineers is managing the Mississippi River. There's a provision in the word of bill that specifies that cost is to be borne 100% by the federal government. All provisions from the Shore Act, which prioritize climate and coastal restoration missions of the Corps of Engineers is in the word of bill. So this is an incredible incredible opportunity for the coastal program as it relates to federal policy provisions. 2022 by the numbers, 11 new construction starts, $407 million in total value. Eight projects were completed with a value of about $740 million. 13 additional miles of levees, 28.3 million cubic yards, which benefited close to 4,300 new acres of land. Last year at this time, members, the five parish region in South Central Louisiana remained very vulnerable to backwater flooding on the Atchafalaya River. Earlier this year, uh, the governor and mem members of this board, Mr. Hidalgo, who has been a champion of this project, cut the ribbon on the Bayou Shane floodgate. An $80 million investment. Thank God we went to bid when we did on that project because inflation is increasing a lot of our costs, Mr. Hidalgo, but now the parishes of St. Mary, St. Martin, Iberville, Assumption, Terrebonne, and even Lafouche um, can sleep a little easier, a little better, uh, knowing that that floodgate is in place. Two words, Mr. Hidalgo. Thank you. You're welcome. The most comprehensive, complex hurricane risk reduction system anywhere in the world was finally completed this year and turned over to the state of Louisiana the largest civil works program in the history of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. A much different picture on the ground following Hurricane Ida than you saw after Hurricane Katrina. 
and that investment paid off in the greater New Orleans area. Last year at this time, Ben Marlborough, who you're going to hear from uh, shortly, was still going through the regulatory process to get a new pump station on the ground, which will triple the flow of fresh water heading down Bayou Lafourche and continue to provide about drinking water to 300,000 residents in the Bayou region. Morganza to the Gulf, significant federal funding and significant uh, state and local funding continues to be invested in that project. As a result of the IIJA, $378 million will be going to construct the two massive floodgates on the GIWW, both east and west, and I believe some work on Miners Canal. And so all of the folks in, in the Bayou region, from Dwayne Bourgeois to Z, other previous members of this board, Reggie Dupree, Gordy Dove, uh, their hard work continues to pay off for Morganza. As all of you know, members, uh, we are approaching a dis record of decision from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on the mid barataria sediment diversion. That decision is going to be coming in December, which will hopefully be followed by a permit, and we hope to be in construction in the largest coastal restoration project in the country sometime next year. Just to highlight a few of the marsh creation projects, you hear people say, why don't we dredge? All we've done up to this point in the coastal program is dredge and pump sediment. From the Cameron Meadows Marsh Creation Project in southwest Louisiana to West Grand Terre to Trinity East Barrier Island to Caminata Headlands Back Barrier Marsh to Bayou Decay to Lake Barn Marsh Creation, all large-scale coastal restoration projects under construction. We've also spent a lot of time and effort over the last year increasing the outreach and engagement that we do with the public from our master plan, our community conversations, going into the 2023 update for the coastal master plan, to attending local uh, maker fairs in Baton Rouge, to continued field trips to the Center for River Studies, and even taking trips to Washington, D.C. with many members of this board and coastal stakeholders to push for more federal funding, and even taking a trip across the pond. Um, a lot of people are looking at these trips across overseas and going, what, what, are we, what are we getting out of these things? I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag here, but at the beginning of December, the state of Louisiana is going to be signing an agreement with the country of France to where you could have actually President Macron after the state dinner coming to Louisiana to sign a climate agreement, not with the United States, but with the state of Louisiana. The governor's office of coastal activity received word just last week that the country of Germany wants to enter into a similar agreement with the state. And so it just goes to show guys that the, the state of Louisiana is really leading from the front when it comes to all of these issues. I hope all of you know in St. Tammany Parish and areas around the North Shore that we are in the throes of developing the 2023 master plan. There's been a series of coastal conversations. These are informal conversations um, and will be followed up with formal public meetings at the beginning uh, of next year. Major federal funding, as I mentioned, Morganza to the Gulf, $378 million, close to $300 million for Southwest Coastal, Atchafalaya Basin, the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, South Pass uh, Jetty Repair. In the supplemental, the environmental, excuse me, the, uh, the Emergency Disaster Relief Bill, $783 million for New Orleans to Venice, additional $450 million for West Shore Lake Pontchartrain. Continued funding for the Atchafalaya Basin, Comey River Diversion, Upper Barataria, Grand Isle, Bayou Signet, and Terrebonne Parish. Excuse me, Tangibaho Parish. We'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Robbie Miller that. <laughs> if you recall, members, when Governor John Bell Edwards was reelected, he set a series of second term priorities for the coastal program focused on climate and resilience, the Mississippi and Atchafalaya rivers, the oyster industry, building strong economic strength as we protect and restore the coast, and new efforts around collaboration and innovation. All of these things are currently underway and much progress has been made on all of these initiatives over the last several years. So members, heading into the final year of this administration, um, I really, really am very proud of the way that we have positioned the coastal program for continued success for the years to come. 
major project decisions are going to be made over the next several months as it relates to Barataria, as it relates to Mississippi River reintroduction into Maripaw Swamp, as it relates to new updated master plan, a new annual plan, and hopefully a RISE Act, which will result in $1.9 billion in additional revenue for the state's coastal program over the next 10 years. And so I just ask that you continue to be involved in this effort, continue uh, your, your passion and uh, for this issue, and uh, really thank you on behalf of Bryn, everybody that works at CPRA, thanks for all of the involvement uh, and the support that you've given us over this last year. So uh, with that, we are gonna transition to an implementation update, the work that has been taking place over the last uh, several weeks since our last meeting, and we're gonna turn it over to Mr. Haas, uh, Executive Director of CPRA. Thank you, Inger. Thank you, Chairman Klein. What a, what a great update, and, and uh, I would certainly uh, borrow your term uh, in, in that certainly proud uh, of everything that you just presented there and, uh, and very happy to uh, acknowledge that none of that could have happened without the support of you all on this board, certainly, uh, and the staff at CPRA and the governor's office as well. So we take a lot of pride in what we do and um, uh, are happy to see uh, the successes that we can celebrate together as Chairman Klein just, uh, just laid out. So thank you again. Appreciate being here. It's good to be uh, in St. Tammany Parish here on the North Shore. I am going to talk a little bit about, uh, as I do each month, some of the things that have been going on sort of uh, a little more, more recently with CPRA. So I'm going to talk with you about the projects that we have currently active. Um, we've got 94 of those uh, in the works right now that are being worked, uh, uh, constructed. 34 of those are being constructed. Those are projects like the North Lafouche Levee Improvement Projects, um, Long Point Bayou Marsh Creation Project over in Cameron Parish, and the Henderson Lakes Bowl Bank Project, um, Gapping Project in St. Martin Parish. 57 projects are in engineering and design right now. Those are projects like the Chandelier Island Restoration Projects, East Bank Sediment Corridor Project, uh, and then three projects in planning, projects like the Lowermost Mississippi River Management Project and the uh, St. Tammany Risk Reduction Project as well. So I want to talk with you a little bit about just a couple that we've completed here recently, some, some more successes. The first one is the Atchafalaya WMA Campground Project. This is uh, a project that is, uh, has been completed on the Wax Lake portion of the Atchafalaya WMA. Uh, it's property managed uh, and, and owned by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. But this is a $4 million project funded through the Natural Resources Damage Assessment uh, pool of funding to improve recreational access to Louisiana's resources that were uh, impacted during the oil spill. It's comprised of about a 1,200 foot long bulkhead. I'll show you some good pictures of that here in just a minute. Uh, about an 80-foot jetty was also um, built uh, along the channel adjacent to the, uh, to the campground there, and then two new 40-foot long docks uh, were constructed to provide improved access to the new camp campground facility. So this gives you an idea of what this area looked like just a few years ago. 2019, I would point out the sort of gray building there. Those are uh, uh, latrine facilities, but you can see sort of how close they are to the water's edge there. Uh, in a few of those pictures, and you can see the condition of the bank uh, along the edge of the campground there. Happy to report, this is what it looks like today. Much improved. You can see that there's a, a lot more uh, land between where that latrine facility was and the, and the shoreline now. You can see the bulkhead that's been completed. The campground has been regraded, and you can see um, one of the docks there, a couple of the docks there actually, um, in this uh, associated with this facility. So happy to report this opened on November 9th, just in time for the uh, West Zone duck season opener on November 10th. This, uh, if you're not familiar with this area, it's one of the uh, premier uh, public access waterfowling areas uh, really in the country and is very, very heavily used by citizens uh, in Louisiana and folks come from really all over the country to hunt in this area. So much improved facilities they will have found uh, for the opening day of duck season uh, recently and into the, uh, the years to come. So this project created about 30 jobs, 39 governmental jobs. Um, happy to uh, report that the companies working on this, All South Consulting and Engineering is headquartered uh, in Metairie, Louisiana, Berry Brothers in Berwick and APS in Baton Rouge. So all Louisiana-based companies were involved in this. And again, I'd like to mention and thank Department of Wildlife and Fisheries for their partnership uh, in getting this project completed. Next project I want to mention uh, is in the same vicinity in St. Mary Parish, and it's the Yokely Levee Extension Project. 
So this is uh, an area um, near an industrial facility called Metal Shark, which is a, a marine or boat building uh, fabrication uh, facility along the Sherrington Canal. And so this project raised uh, levees and flood walls to protect this area up to an elevation of about 10 and a half feet. This is an area where a lot of flood fighting has occurred uh, in recent hurricane uh, seasons uh, of 2020 primarily uh, and 2019 as well with Hurricane Barry. Um, total project length here is just about a mile uh, of improved levees and flood walls. Um, and there's kind of an innovative uh, part to this. You may have seen this, anybody who's been to the Corps of Engineers recently have seen this system deployed or being uh, constructed in their parking lot. And so you see it here as well. This is a, a situation where you've got, again, an industrial facility here that needs access to the water. Uh, a levee or permanent flood wall with gates is not really a feasible solution for this location. Um, but these metal pins and metal uh, braced uh, flood wall system that you see here is uh, is uh, a good solution. And so you can see that being built and uh, being uh, uh, put in place and deployed here. So this is something that can be deployed in a matter of hours uh, very quickly, obviously, as a hurricane is approaching this area. This uh, levy, Yokely levee extension, I'm, I'm happy to report, actually uh, completes the ring basically from the Wax Lake outlet that I was talking about earlier to the Sherrington Canal. So there's a, a, a much more complete system in that region of the state for hurricane risk, risk reduction than there was before this was completed. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that have gone on in St. Tammany Parish as well. Um, so uh, about $143 million worth of projects have been invested in St. Tammany Parish just in the last 15 years or so. Uh, seven projects have been completed with another five that are being implemented right now. And last year, as Mr. Falsina uh, alluded to, the legislature uh, reapproved and, and transferred several or three projects to CPRA that I'll touch on here in just a minute. So some of the highlights uh, of those projects include the Goose Point, Point Platte Marsh Creation Project, uh, the Madisonville Bulkhead Project, that's the facility that Mr. Paulsina referred to that would be behind that, uh, that jetty along the Chifuncta River. Uh, very high use, popular area, of course, to access the lake and the, and the river there. The Bayou Bonfuca Marsh Creation Project is another one of those. And then the Middle Pearl River uh, WMA boat launch was completed uh, here recently as well. The other three projects that I mentioned uh, that were approved through the legislature this past year include, uh, they're all in the Slidell region, the South Slidell Fritchie Coastal Resilience Project, the Military Road Flood Risk Reduction Project, and the Eden Isle Roadway Infrastructure Project. And so we're working with the parish and the levy districts on getting those projects designed and advanced as well. I want to talk about some upcoming meetings that some of you may be uh, interested in. The first uh, is related to the two freshwater diversions in the southeastern portion of the state here, the Carnarvon Interagency Advisory Commission and the Davis Committee, excuse me, and the Davis Pond Advisory Committee will be meeting uh, on December 13th at 9 and 10.30 a.m. respectively um, on the UNO campus at the Lindy Boggs Center. So if you're interested in what's going on with those projects, um, just take note of that and certainly feel free to participate in those meetings. We've got some QIPRA meetings coming up. QIPRA, as you all know, is the Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection and Restoration Act. It's really been the bedrock of the restoration program in coastal Louisiana. Two meetings will be coming up uh, in December and January, uh, on December 8th and January 19th. Both of those will be at the Corps of Engineers at 930. This is kind of an important round of meeting, meetings. These are the meetings where uh, essentially the projects that have been planned for this entire year will be evaluated and selections will be made as to which projects will move forward to construction uh, over the next year or years and uh, which projects will move into engineering and design. So an announcement was recently made by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I want to mention those as well. Uh, CPRA was fortunate to receive about a million of the almost five and a half million that was awarded to Louisiana through the NIFWIF America, the Beautiful Challenge Grant. So this project will uh, um, put uh, a project that's been long thought of in the central wetlands area um, near, the, near the lower Ninth Ward in Orleans Parish, um, uh, hydrologic and habitat restoration project there. So it'll be designing that. It'll uh, improve about 16,000 acres that will be available for additional partnering opportunities, plantings, uh, other hydrologic restoration, and, and so forth. So we're happy to have been awarded that and for that Louisiana continues to be successful uh, in competing for and receiving grants uh, associated with those um, uh, NIFWIF dollars. I wanted to just mention this as well. Uh, we had a very successful volunteer 
planning event on the West Grand Terre Island. So I've talked with you about the project. Uh, we've recently completed it, of course. It was impacted by Hurricane Ida. We went back in. Uh, we're able to, uh, to salvage the project and, and come out with a quite nice-looking project. In fact, I flew over it yesterday. It looks fantastic uh, as of yesterday morning. Um, I'm proud to uh, and, and thankful for uh, Representative Joe Ogeron, who's the Executive Director of Restore Retreat, and uh, Polly Glover, who many of you know, who's just been a tremendous coastal champion supporter of this program. But they uh, approached me probably about eight months ago uh, asking about the opportunity to potentially do some plantings on this island to help uh, speed up vegetation on the island, st stabilize the sediment and so forth. Uh, all of that came to fruition on Saturday morning. They led about 30 volunteers in planting almost 8,500 uh, plugs of smooth cordgrass and black mangroves in one of the uh, fish dips on the backside of that island. They had individuals from France, uh, from Spain, from other places all over the United States. They had students from LSU, Nickel State, high school students from East Ascension and Santa Ma uh, in uh, Ascension Parish as well. So just a tremendous effort. I know um, in talking with Polly, she's uh, got a, a personal connection with this island. Her father designed the Lyle Santa Ma Marine Lab that was operated by Wildlife and Fisheries for many years on that island. So. She was very thankful, and uh, I think this effort had uh, certainly a deeper meaning for her uh, with the connection with her dad uh, in this location on this island. So always good to have volunteers and other partners uh, helping to uh, enhance the projects that we have built and are constructing and, um, and just to have more people involved in the coastal program overall. It's a great thing, and certainly we were happy that that, that occurred. I mentioned to you, I believe it was at the last meeting, that the Seeds of Innovation Design Resilience Competition was coming to an end shortly after the last board meeting they did pick a winner for the planter boxes uh, the first place was team larynx underground um, and these planter boxes of course will this design was chosen uh, and planter boxes will be uh, manufactured and deployed in the grand bayou area that community in plaquemines parish uh, as part of this program for more information there you can see uh, go to waterflowsforward.com and you can learn more about the different designs in that process uh, as well so Chairman Klein mentioned this, but I certainly wanted to mention that uh, as we are, um, you know, approaching 2023 uh, and the master plan with the same date, um, we uh, have been in communities here for the last couple of weeks having conversations. These are more informal discussions. Um, you can see the settings. We've uh, been able to partner with uh, many NGOs and others around uh, the communities to actually serve a dinner. Um, have conversations in a round table facilitated by CPRA staff and some of our other partners as well. We've been in Bell Chase, uh, New Orleans at Xavier University. We've been in Miro and in LaRose so far. Have had really good turnout at these and some really good discussions. We've gotten some, uh, some nice feedback, I think, from these meetings as well. Been about 50 or 60 folks at each of these meetings so far. <clears throat> And the purpose of these, again, is not really to talk, talk to these people or talk at these folks, right, that are attending these meetings about what we want to do, but really to hear from them. How are we doing? What do you want to see in a master plan? What's good? What's bad? What do we need to do better? Um, that kind of feedback. And so it's been really, really refreshing and rewarding to be able to have some of those conversations and been really impressed with the engagement of the participants, um, the level of knowledge uh, related to our coastal program, quite frankly. I was involved in some of these same kind of conversations back in 2017. Folks know a whole lot more about what we do, how we do it, and where we're doing it, I can tell you, uh, in 2022 than they did back in 2016 and 2017. So we'll have a few more of these coming up. We'll be uh, here uh, in St. Tammany Parish through this evening. Uh, we have a meeting in Lacombe at the North Shore Technical Community College from 6 to 8 this evening. We'll be in Abbeville tomorrow uh, about midday. We'll be in Gonzales on the 30th, and then we'll have uh, several other meetings that are to be uh, scheduled uh, that will be coming up in December. So uh, that concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, hope you uh, uh, got something out of that and certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Haas. Great update. Do we have any questions for Bryn? So Dwayne has a question. So I think they turned all the mics off, so I'm gonna hold on one second. Try that. What was the funding source? Uh, Go, Go Mesa dollars. Go Mesa. Yep. And the um, the particular the, about 820 feet of the flood wall construction. Who's the manufacturer of the flood wall? Um, 
Do you know? I, I don't know that. I don't know. Yeah. Certainly, I can find out for you. Well, um, we'll, we'll need to circle back. I think there's some good applications for that that we have in some areas that's very difficult to work with, and so this is really good innovative solution there. Yeah, good. There are only two places that I'm aware of, uh, at least in coastal Louisiana, again, where that's being used. One is at Yokely, and the other is in the in the course parking lot. Uh, right. For I've the MRL. Both, both locations. Yeah. We, we've, um, I mean, we've got similar structures, but just for gateways, it's compared to a, a, a wall. Yeah. Uh, I like this idea. Thank you. That's all I have. Yep. I'll find out for you and let you know. Oh, you did? <laughs> President Cooper says he knows who it is. <laughs> I met him in the course parking lot. All right, thank you. I'm sure Ms. Ms. Dayrees and probably Director Tingle from GOSEP uh, recalled during, I believe it was Laura Delta, Ida, all of the various storms we were getting calls from Mr. Hidalgo, Tim Mott, uh, Brett Island, that area. Uh, and there's a metal sharp area in there. There's a lot of industrial facilities. Uh, so it's just good to have that, that closure in place. We, we were throwing. Hesco baskets, dumpsters, dumpsters with gravel covered in sand. I mean, you name it at that area. So it is, uh, it's a great comfort to me. And I know uh, the other folks that, that work in that area and that work in this, this, uh, uh, in this business uh, to be able to have a more permanent solution and an easier deployed solution there. <laughs> There's always time for thank yous, Mr. Hidalgo. <laughs> Yep, we'll, we'll track that down and get it to you, Dwayne. Yep. Any other questions for Brim? Yep, Ms. Cormier, uh, let me do a count here. One. Try that. Thank you, Brim. What about that? Thank you, Brim, for your presentation. Um, I have a question as well on the Yorkley level extension. I, I, you may have said it, I may not have heard it. Is it a permanent structure that will be there permanently or do the, they remove it after <clears throat> after they need it? About roughly 4,000 feet uh, of levee was constructed, but uh, a little less than 1,000 feet, it's about 850 feet, I believe, of that, that metal wall uh, can be deployed. And so there are pins that can be deployed and set um, in foundations, essentially. And then you saw the, the, the crossbars or the cross members being slid into the um, into the into those pins. So those are removed and are not there typically. Uh, obviously, if a hurricane is approaching, you can set the pins, slide the cross members in there, wow. and you have a, a flood wall, instant, almost instant flood wall. So it can be deployed again in a matter of about five or six hours. Great. That's greatness. Um, also, I just want to compliment y'all on the community conversations. This is an idea we started in Southwest Louisiana many, many years ago, and I thought it was really important that um, we just sat around and talked about community issues and mm -hmm. to see it, you know, today as what it's, it's evolved into, it's such greatness to hear from local people about their ideas about coastal Louisiana. So I appreciate y'all still continuing to do that because I think it's very, very important. It's been a really, um, um, thank you for that, Ms. Cormier, first. And I would just say that it's been very rewarding to see kind of the progression from the 2017 plan that I was certainly involved in and, and seeing where we are today. And again, kind of just the level of engagement, the understanding um, of, of what we do um, and just the, the, yeah, the more in-depth conversation we've been able to have because of people are just more aware of what we do and how we do it. So well, it's been... And I can remember when we started and it was a more us against them thing. And now it's more of a, we're all going to work together and sure. solve this problem. Yep. And so that level of communication and openness that you guys had and your willingness to change your mind about rocket, rocket, rocket uh, in <laughs> Southwest Louisiana and to really listen to some of the people that have lived there. It, they heard um, what you were saying. You heard what they were saying. Y'all work together. We all work together to make it happen. And great things uh, obviously are occurring with this board and my fellow board members for each of us listening to each other and realizing it's the state of Louisiana as a whole moving forward to do what's best to prevent people from flooding and for our citizens across the the state. So thank you very much. Now we just need to all work really hard on getting our northern Louisiana neighbors to understand what we're doing down here so that they will support us in a 
uh, constitutional millage uh, to include all levy boards. So that's our next big job. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cormier, we're going to North Louisiana on November 28th, Woo. 9th. If you would like to tag along for that, yes, you can take your rocket, rocket, rocket mission up to North Louisiana. Yes, I'll be happy to <laughs> send me an email. <laughs> I do appreciate your comments, though, Ms. Cormier. You know, I remember the public meetings for 2012 master plan. And so does Z. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, those were, um, let's just say, a, a different ball game compared to where we are now in the conversations and the, the relationships that have been developed. And I really, quite frankly, the trust, I think, that has been developed um, between state government and local governments when it comes to this issue. So um, good reflection, Ms. Cormier. Any other questions for uh, Brim? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Thank you all. All right, members, uh, moving on to agenda item number nine, we're going to get an update on the St. Tammany uh, feasibility study, which is I'm um, guessing why many of the members of the public from St. Tammany are here today. Uh, you heard President Cooper mention this. You heard Randy Paucina mention this. You heard Mr. Haas. You heard me. Before Amy uh, gets going, I hope that everybody that lives in St. Tammany Parish looks at this as an incredible opportunity. Two years ago, this wasn't even a thought. And now we are going through a process with the Corps of Engineers. We got an extension, and I'm sure Amy's going to talk about, to get to where we can have a chief's report for a $4 billion risk reduction system for St. Tammany. That is an incredible opportunity. Um, and so there's been a lot of work, a lot of collaboration with President Cooper, with Suzanne Krieger, who I still have not laid eyes on Suzanne today. I know she's not. Where is she? Oh, she's out in the hall taking a break. There she is. Um, and so there's just been a lot of work to get us to this point. And I think we're um, very much looking forward, Ms. Dixon, hearing what you have to say this morning. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. On behalf of Colonel Jones, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. He was unfortunately unable to attend, and he looks forward to attending in the future when you ask for updates on his projects. Um, this is the St. Tammany Parish Feasibility Study. Um, I just want to say, President Cooper, uh, to see the projects that you have outlined, many of them, at least three, that Mr. Paucina presented were part of the initial planning phase in this study. And while the federal government couldn't justify uh, participation in those in projects, it's great to see they're being executed um, by the parish and then with cooperation with the state. So thank you for that. Um, so this project is 33 months of 52. Um, we recently received an exemption, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. but. Um, I just want to say thank you again to our non-federal sponsor, CPRA, and also the stakeholders, which are in this room, President Cooper, uh, Ms. Krieger. We've, we've appreciated a great working relationship this far uh, and look forward to continuing that. So initially, our project was authorized under the WIND Act of 2016. Uh, we need two steps from the federal government to initiate a study. The first is that authorization piece, and then we were authorized um, in 2016, receiving funding from BB18 in 2018. That authorized us for a three by three study. So we had three years and $3 million to execute a study to reduce flood risk to St. Tammany Parish. We recently received an exemption, which increased our time and cost to focus on that $4 billion effort we identified. Here's our current schedule. You can see we initiated the study in January of 2020. We did go through multiple milestones with our vertical chain through the tentatively selected plan where we identified um, the features that we would like to see in the execution of the chief's report. And we had that agency decision milestone in August of 21 where the core endorsed our plan uh, moving forward. That exemption was requested the following month to further analyze components of the plan with a $4 billion investment. We needed to make sure that the feasibility level design on all aspects of the project was up to par and ready to go to chief support. So we're focused right now on that cost certification. All the details of um, um, the project are in the works for cost. 
We're doing a non-structural plan, which I'll talk about in a second. We had to optimize that as well. And then we're focused on those community outreach aspects as we move forward. You'll see that public review in July of next year. We welcome all members of the public, all stakeholders to make comments on the plan. And we'll incorporate those as we move to chief's report in 2024. $4 billion is a great investment for this parish. I'm a lifelong resident. Um, to see the community and the impacts that this could have on the community is a great relief to myself and hopefully the rest of the, the members of the community involved. I know President Cooper is extremely excited about it. Um, I'm gonna start with the purple dots you see. That is the non-structural plan. It is about half of the $4 billion plan. Initially, we had identified 8,500 structures in the 50-year floodplain for the parish. Those 8,500 structures would make this project one of the top five in the USACE enterprise for non-structural plans. It is a very large and robust community that will be raised or floodproofed out of the 100-year floodplain. For those of us that are impacted by frequent flooding, I would say that's a very big investment and a very big deal. Um, many communities in coordination with uh, the parish, when you look at non-structural, there's usually a cost issue for people to participate. Even with grant programs, citizens still have to come up with a cost share. This would be a federal project and executed with CPRA, hopefully at no cost to the homeowner. So that non-structural plan, like I said, is currently at 8,500 structures. We are optimizing it with that exemption funding. We anticipate the number of structures changing as we look at flood source. Um, there are 19 identified flood sources for our optimization efforts, and each one of them will have their own non-structural plan. So we anticipate that 8,500 structure changing, but not by much. It's going to remain a very robust plan. The second one I'm gonna talk about is in the city of Covington. Mile Branch is a 2.5 mile branch of the Chifuncta River. We are looking at um, deepening that channel by about five feet. That project, while relatively small for the area, has big impacts around the community. It'll reduce water surface elevation in a very densely populated area. The next uh, line you see on the screen is the large green levee. That is an 18 mile levy. Uh, it has been optimized. Uh, it went from 16 miles up to 18 as we plan for the future horizon of that levy. So in 2082, it will need to be 18 miles long and at some places, places 21 feet high. That will reduce the flood risk to a large, um, large expanse of Slidell and Western Slidell. And with $2 billion of estimate, estimated cost, it is a huge chunk, just like that non-structural of our plan. We do sit at a healthy benefit to cost ratio of 1.8. That is one of the federal guidelines for us. We do have to sit above unity or above a benefit cost ratio of one. And that um, BCR is a healthy one for future authorization and funding. So I'll wrap up. Brief, brief update, um, we did kick off our study in um, January of 20, but you can see we've executed all of our major milestones, all of our decision points. We are really focused on that feasibility level design and making sure that the levy, the non-structural plan and mile branch channel improvements are situated to move forward um, and obtain authorization in May of 2024. Once again, we'll have public review, which we will welcome the public to comment on our plan We'll have public meetings then, and we'll also have some um, environmental justice outreach meetings prior to July. Um, all of that information will be available on our website, and we'll make um, announcements in the paper, Facebook, and with partnership with CPR, I'm sure we'll have um, some shared outlets. I think Mr. Klein reiterated the point that this is a big effort for St. Tammany Parish. In May of 24, that chief's report, we are positioned to be in WERDA of 24 for authorization and potential funding. So we're moving forward with a large plan to hopefully reduce the risk to 15,000 or more structures in St. Tammany Parish. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Dixon, for that for that update. D just one question or one point that I would ask for you to clarify or discuss a little further. And you mentioned a, a BCR of 1.8 for for this project, and so those are that is based upon things that the Corps of Engineers currently has in perhaps the TSP. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little bit about how the BCR would potentially impact a finalized chief's report or subsequent authorization or subsequent funding? Sure. And so, but then also, I think it's important while you said 1.8 BCR is a healthy BCR for authorization and funding, if other elements that were asked to be looked at were included, it could throw the BCR off to where it would make it less competitive for funding. Correct. And so I, I just ask you to discuss that a little bit more. So there's, there's been a lot of interest in St. Tammany Parish about asking for the Corps to look at different alignments, different pieces to include in this. And you have agreed to do that by granting the extension. I believe your extension is through January of 24. Mm -hmm. um, what I don't want to see happen is, is for us to include things in this tentatively selected plan that could then potentially throw off the BCR to where we are back at ground zero when it comes to an authorization and funding. So can, can you just talk a little bit more about that, if you could, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> So when you look at a levy alignment and you look at the placement of the levy, whenever you incorporate features into the levy, you have to look at the benefits that are accompanied by it. While the Slidell levy would reduce flood risk as a whole to the majority of Slidell, we could potentially shift that levy alignment around and include more structures. We've looked at roughly, doing math in my head for all of the segments, 25 different alignments now from the 18 mile a levy alignment. We've tried to pull in as much of the community as possible, incorporating all of the homes that are in the area and left out. Um, I say left out, we'll come back to that in a second, but without the justification of benefits achieved, we cannot justify an increased cost. The levy alignment is extremely expensive, as we all know. However, you can incorporate plan homes that are left out or structures left out through that non-structural plan. So you'll see on the outside of that levy, those purple dots. Um, much of the community of Slidell is going to be raised. However, not enough benefits are accrued to incorporate them in the levy alignment. That structural raising will get that home and their contents out of the floodplain for a 100-year flood um, and will we'll accrue benefits in that direction rather than incorporation into the levy alignment. Now, if we were to move the levy and the BCR would go down, like I said, we need above one. Um, and we did the math for many of the alignments, and it did not equate to an above one calculation. Um, one of our... One of our chiefs will tell us every, every meeting we have, usually close to two, 2.0, will get you the funding that you need to construct. So while one is passable, two is preferred. Did that answer your question? It, it did. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Cormier, I know Ms. Cormier is about to hit the mic button because Southwest Coastal is at a five BCR. So um, just for a competitiveness standpoint, Southwest Coastal is, I think, very attractive for a Funny symbol. Th that's helpful, uh, Amy. I mean, everybody, when we go through these 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 studies, these feasibility studies of getting to a TSP, you know, everybody has what they call a Cadillac version or what I call a Cadillac version. If everybody gets what they want in the plan, but that could then throw off the BCR to where, and I, I guess one of the questions that I keep asking to our legal folks, could, could a, a negative BCR impact even getting to a chief's report yeah and yes. that is something that i don't want to see happen yeah. um we won't we won't go to chief's report with a negative vcr we cannot recommend a plan with a negative vcr it's against policy for you okay thank you for clarifying that for mm -hmm. uh the record before i open it up to any other um members there have been a lot of discussions on the eden isles 
area that is not included in this plan, and we have made uh, commitments to parish leaders, levy district leaders, that the state will be taking on the responsibility of providing risk reduction for the Eden Isles community. I, I would also reiterate that we have had $9 million allocated for St. Tammany Parish for Slidell ring levies, other risk reduction projects. If the parish, Mr. Cooper, if you are ready, based upon where we think we're going on this study, to begin some engineering, design, planning work for the Eden Isles community, utilizing that million do $9 million that we have, I'm all for it. And so just to remind you all that we have $9 million in our trust fund allocated for St. Tammany Parish that we're kind of waiting to see how this is going to shake out. And I think we've got a pretty clear indication on that. So whenever, whenever you're ready to make a call on that, President Cooper, we're ready. Uh, back to you, Ms. Dixon. I would ask, I believe there was a meeting uh, last week or maybe the week before with core leadership on this specific project. Senator Hewitt was there. Representative Dubuchon was there. I believe the parish president was there. And th there are, I think, a little bit more weedy questions, in-depth questions on how the core calculates a BCR and how do you get to that 1.8. And so would just reiterate if Colonel Jones, Mr. Wingate, and yourself could maybe um, call that meeting, that would be very helpful just so parish leaders understand how that, that BCR is, we got to it. Absolutely. And um, after discussing with Colonel Jones and Mr. Wingate, we are looking at cost updates. Um, this week, we're starting cost updates. So we were hoping to kind of delay that meeting until we had cost numbers that were updated for that new levy alignment to discuss. Any other questions? Any other questions for uh, Ms. Cormier? Are you still on, Lori? I think I so. Okay. I'm not yep. sure. Yep. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm very happy to see this for St. Tammany Parish and, and in the future. Having been uh, working with the Corps um, for 13 years from the Southwest Coastal Feasibility Study, we did have a 50 BCA. And um, just to let you know, um, whatever you do, you do not want to go anywhere near a one point anything BCA because it, the more um, cost benefit you have, the better off you're going to be in the future. And so what we decided early on was whatever was the best BCA we could get, we were going to go for so that we could start um, our coastal um, restoration projects sooner as opposed to later. So the more you uh, don't communicate now, and it, it'll just prolong it even further. So I've been in this fight for 13 years, and we just got that, that amount of money for Southwest Louisiana, which I'm so grateful and thankful for. But, but your, your fight is not on where the levy should go. It's like it needed to be there 50 years ago. So we got to just everybody agree that we're going to get the best BCA number we can to get it in so that it can get funded. Anyway, that's my opinion, and I hope it works for y'all. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Mr. Bourgeois, hold on one second here. I'm dean on this. My control. My control. You're Mr. Dean today. Yes, I'm Dean. Uh, That's what Councilman to Dean, what you're up. Is. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, thanks, Chip. A good presentation. Uh, I, I have to I have to say the same thing in a bit to what Laurie says. I mean, we had our Marganza to the Golf Project. We were sitting at 1.3, 1.4. We never got anybody's attention until we got it to about a five on the BCA. So BCA is everything. Uh, a low BCA. So whatever you're working towards. My only question would be is we wound up kind of having to reduce our BCA after the fact. We did an adaptive criteria assessment report, which because the state was so helpful to us and we were able to continue to put things on the ground, we were able to demonstrate that the process that the core was using for pricing wasn't reflecting our particular reality. So my question would be, is there an opportunity possibly for this project, which would love to see come to fruition, to, to, to use some of the same things we did after the fact, before the fact, in this case. So to, to look into that adaptive criteria assessment report and see the things we used that showed that our, our um, methods that we were proving by working with the state and the locals who, who, who worked on this project 
um, we didn't need to have some of the cost elements that the core had in it. And I would just suggest that you, you look at that to see if there's any thing you can mine to lower your cost, which immediately runs your BCR up on this without any other changes. You get into changes, I think you guys are, what was it, 30 something into 52? You just need to go. That's what, that's what needs to happen here. I, I don't know the details and I'm not trying to leave anybody out, but you, you need to get across that finish line. But if you can do anything right now to improve the BCR, not negatively impacted by bringing anything in, I think that that would be it because 1.8 is good, but I've never seen anything move recently below two as you have. And, and I think that's a very valid point. Thank you. Um, so when we submitted our exemption package, it was to the dollar to the activity. Um, so while I don't necessarily think we would be able to change our path forward um, for calculating cost right now, it is definitely on the table for PED um, after authorization. I will say, though, that when we did the calculations for um, levy alignment shifts or movements, we did use actual costs. For example, we took West Shore Lake Pontchartrain and did what they're using right now to put it on the ground. That was the cost we incorporated, not necessarily the theoretical cost or um, a, a high contingency based on what we have to do for cost um, evaluation. It was boots on the ground, construction costs, real time. Um, so that gives us a level of confidence, at least right now, that we are on the right path. Um, like I said, that, that new levy alignment with the 18 miles is going back to cost right now, and we'll see what it comes out with um, in a few months. It's going to take we, a couple we of months. We, in addition to the actual construction costs, proved on some geotechnical stuff with a lot of help from the um, um, CPRA's geotechnical group that we could build a smaller levy and get the same impacts and that reduce the cost too. So I would suggest you look again back to the ACAR for that aspect of it. I, I like the idea that you're using real costs. That's that's better than where we were as, as, as well. Thank you. That's it. Lessons learned from Organza, right? Mm -hmm. hard, hard lessons. So, and Southwest Coastal too. So, uh, Amy, I'm just looking at your timeline once again. So we're looking for a chief's report by May of 2024, which I believe would put us in a prime spot to get this project authorized, which is really what the ultimate goal is, is an authorization followed by subsequent funding um, for the word of bill in 2024. You, do you anticipate utilizing the full timeline of completing the extension? Or is there, yes. you know, I'm always going to ask the question if we can move things to the left a little bit. We appreciate the question. Yeah. Um, we actually, when we went to uh, request the exemption at our very final briefing, our schedule was cut four months to hit WARDA. Um, I would hate to push my team, especially with that public review coming up. Um, that's one of the things that's mandated, and a lot of the time periods you're looking at um, in the full schedule are mandated by policy. So I cannot say that we would skip it. Of course, we would like to, mm -hmm. but um, as of right now, that's about the best we can do. Okay. Uh, last comment I'll make on this, Ms. Dixon, is that I, I just think um, I'll, I'll say early and often, I know we're not early, but often and frequent communication with locals on this is important. And so I just as we continue to move, you know, these meetings at core district headquarters is important, are important. And um, we just ask that we continue that overall collaboration, coordination with, with locals on the ground here in St. Tammany. We'll do. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? We're good. Ms. Dixon, thank you for Mr. Cooper. Go ahead. You might have to light my button. Admin 1. Admin 1. There you go. Thank you. I certainly want to thank the core, uh, CPRA, uh, St. Tammany, uh, Levy District, and all those involved in uh, developing this plan over the past That's nearly three years. Uh, we're at a point where, uh, as we continue to move forward, my goal and my hopes are to have the best plan available with the money that is available in the time that is available to benefit as many of our citizens as possible. This is a parish-wide plan, both structural and non-structural, and uh, please continue forward as to include as much as possible to meet the cost-benefit uh, ratio uh, that's needed as well as benefiting as many of our citizens as possible. Yep. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, Ms. Dixon, thank you very much. Thank you all today.
We hope to see Colonel Jones at a future board meeting soon, but I know he's busy working on all of our other projects over the New Orleans district, but thank you for, for being here. All right, members, moving on to agenda item number 10, we're going to get an update on the implementation of the LCA Barataria Basin Barrier Shoreline Feasibility Study Project. That's quite a mouthful. We're going to get Mr. Uh, Darren Lee with CPRA up for this presentation. This is also in your packets, members. Yeah, good morning. Um, while this is, is about the LCA uh, completion of, of the LCA Barataria Bar uh, Basin Barrier Shoreline uh, projects, it's also a little, about a little bit more than that, which is sort of uh, CPRA and, and other entities, partners touching on pretty much the whole uh, Barataria shoreline. Uh, again, I don't have to tell the board uh, about the problem here uh, and the projected uh, future problems. Um, and, and of course, in that context, along the shorelines, uh, you know, uh, severe uh, shoreline erosion is occurring and, and wetland loss, uh, again, with some of the highest rates uh, reported around the world, uh, particularly uh, paying attention to the Camp Nada, uh shoreline uh, and then uh, further to uh, further to the uh, east, the Shell Island. And those were those were the original components of, of the uh, Barataria that were selected alternative. Um, and, and of course, dealing with that shoreline erosion and projections uh, for, for the uh, coastal uh, area of Barataria. The master plan, of course, says we're gonna do work on these uh, shorelines and maintain them. And of course, at the tune of about $1.5 billion projected over, over the next 50 years. Uh, and as has been mentioned, you know, the year of the dredge, uh, you add that to the marsh creation total, and, and of course that's a lot of money with direct dredging, uh, and Barrier Islands are part of that. The issue historically, and this is kind of the historic uh, portion of this, is that you know when you looked at the shoreline and whether you looked at what we call the, the modern delta uh, up here or you looked at the late Lafouche delta, uh, you know, again, uh, Land loss dominated the, the parts of the process. We were losing more land than we were gaining, which is typical. And even into the uh, late Lafouche, while we were pretty much even, maybe a little bit more gain uh, than loss, there was a significant portion of that loss along, along the shorelines. And of course, several studies predicted some of those areas would be totally gone by the year 2045 if we did, did nothing to improve those. Uh, the good news is, again, through programs like LCA, we did feasibility studies with the Corps, uh, looked at selected alternatives and selected some of those alternatives. And again, the Caminata Shell Island area was the selected alternative to have the most impact. Uh, and, and so uh, the other thing is that they were already at sort of advanced levels of investigation uh, and they could provide potentials for construction within the next 10 years. Uh, as many of you are aware, really the LCA funding uh, never materialized in sufficient quantities in order to implement these. But the good news is, is that those two projects uh, or those two regions of the state were done uh, through various projects. Um, this is the area of, of Shell Island and particularly in, in the left portion of the map in 2010. Uh, and as you can see, uh, by 2015, uh, Shell Island East project was completed in 2013, uh, about two and a half million cubic yards. Uh, and it was done through parts of the berm to barrier dollars uh, with the oil spill. And then by uh, 2021, additional work was done through Deepwater Horizon NERD dollars, another 5.8 million cubic yards pumped. And by 2017, that was in place. And by 2021, uh, you can see uh, that, that total rebuilding of Shell Island. And, and again, just from the dramatic standpoint, oh, I may have messed, up, messed myself up here. No, I got it. Uh, again, from, from 2010 to 2020, 21, the, the drastic uh, impact we can have through, through direct dredging. Uh, is is remarkable, and I want to point out that again, you know, part of this is to point out that additional projects were done through additional funding sources like Quipra and and NERDA and, and things like that to uh, supplement other portions of the shoreline, Pelican Island, Schofield. Uh, those projects were completed, and so the other portion was Caminata uh, headland portion. Uh, and again, you know, the idea there was uh, we went to Ship Shoal, 
uh, approximately 27 miles uh, and pump sediment in, in two various uh, projects. And again, this one in 2012, you can see the beach is fairly narrow and, and low. Uh, well, it's hard to see that it's low, but take my word for it. <laughs> And, and so we did the Caminata Beach and Dune increment one, uh, again, 2.9 million cubic yards pumped. You can see that sort of on the, on the southwestern portion of the beach right in front of uh, Port Fouchon uh, as of 2015. Uh, that was done through some CAP and state surplus funds. Um, and then by 2022, really in 2016, we completed through NIFWIF Gulf Environmental Benefit Funds, uh, pumped another 4.9 million cubic yards. And so basically had touched that, that complete 13 miles of, of the Caminata Headland. Uh, and this happens to be a 2022 uh, photograph post Ida. Uh, so I couldn't show you Shell Island post Ida because the imagery was, was not uh, good. But uh, it survived the storms. Obviously the sand was moved around, but you can still see a nice wide beach. Uh, there are again some areas of, of high ground and, and uh, habitats available and, and no breaches in that shoreline with Ida pretty much passing right over it. Uh, you also will notice that as part of this, uh, there's a small line back here, which is the containment dike for the Caminata Back Marsh uh, project, uh, which was just completed. This was done through Quipra uh, funds. And so this is part of why we're here. This is the, the last piece of, of those original project designed through LCA and, and selected alternative. Uh, and again, it was just completed pumping in, in October uh, of this year where we built uh, back marsh behind the uh, beaches and dunes. Uh, again, here, here it is under construction. Uh, so you can see the previous Caminata projects uh, that built beach and dune. And then you can see the area for marsh fill that was completed here in, in October. Um, Again, it, it got underway in August uh, and was completed by October, uh, and it's mainly offshore sediments, uh, some, some sands, but mostly uh, silts and clays to produce back marsh. Uh, and, and the idea, again, was to get it at an elevation and a material that would flow into existing wetlands, uh, supplement them, and, and create new wetlands in between these, these open water areas. Um, I think the big thing about all of this uh, and the message maybe we're trying to get across is, again, even though this wasn't done in, during LCA, that money and that effort done in the LCA feasibility studies and the environmental things that went forward were integral to getting these other projects advanced in a, in a, a fast time period. They helped put those projects on the ground. They sort of made them at the point where even though the funding didn't materialize through LCA, other funding sources were able to be captured because that existing work that was done and those efforts that were done. Um, in total, when you add all that up, then the other thing, message maybe I'm trying to get across today is that, you know, one program does the feasibility, another does the construction, et cetera, et cetera. You know, NERD is chipping in money to do monitoring on our barrier shorelines for all these projects. And I think that the overall message is, is that our ability to take these various funding sources, cobble them together, has, has results for the, for the overall system, uh, particularly within the context of other projects that are being done. So again, you know, the Barataria region, just within its uh, 2006, uh, when we started, has had about 56 million cubic yards pumped in it. Uh, and, and again, you can see uh, you know, a lot of, of cubic yards uh, in, in both the late Lafourche Delta and the modern Delta region uh, being placed along the shorelines. And, and incidentally, uh, since the 90s, uh, I'll go back uh, older than, than CPRA, uh, you know, we've put, pumped almost 98 million cubic yards along, along the central coastal shoreline uh, of Louisiana and, and had great results. And, and the results of that uh, is now, and, and this is a bit small, but when you look at the modern Delta, uh, you now see that where land loss was dominating land gain uh, up until 2005, land gain is now dominating uh, land loss. In other words, we're overpowering this land loss along this coastal shoreline through a multitude of projects and, and, a, and a, a, I guess, I won't say a constant, but a, a, uh, a stepwise uh, integration of, of projects over time. And so, you know, we, we basically are able to take these projections of island disappearance and, and turn them into longevity uh, in, into the future. 
And, you know, I've presented this before, but, you know, this is an indication of, you know, that shoreline erosion that we were seeing, particularly in, in one section here in, in Chaland and, and Bajo Wise. You know, we did projects, we moved the shoreline gulfward, uh, but you'll see that even post-project, many of these sections are still showing shoreline accretion. And that's because we put in this sediment in the system and that sediment is being moved and it's benefiting those downdrift areas. And it's making those areas by, by closing some of these gaps that were in the shoreline here just through natural processes, we basically are maintaining that sediment within the system for longer periods of time. And it's benefiting those shorelines in the long term. You know, things we still need to look at, as everybody said, you know, I'll go down to the bottom, cost benefit. You know, can we do these projects uh, better, make them last longer? Can we do them faster and can we do them cheaper? Uh, and part of that is continuing to look at, you know, these land changes and habitat changes, uh, how, how we've affected sediment volumes in particular, how much sediment volume we need over time, and do a better job of placing that sediment in the appropriate areas where, again, it's going to have those long-term benefits. And we're continuing to look at that. And, and part of that is, you know, again, going to this idea that um, rather than project by project, it's more, you know, combining all these programs, combining all these projects, and having a systemic effect along a piece of shoreline or a region of shoreline. And part of that is when you look in the master plan in 2017 and you kind of look a little bit at what's going on in 2023, you know, the barrier islands are, we're going to spend $1.5 billion. But, you know, how are we going to spend that $1.5 billion? And that's where now starting to develop a systematic uh, system management approach where we're looking at where our sediments are, uh, where's the best place to use those sediments, and where is the science and engineering telling us are the appropriate places to place that sediment so that we get, again, a uh, better bang for our buck. So we've, we've made a, a first uh, wave across the coast. Uh, we've placed sediment, again, on every island uh, and every stretch of shoreline, not only in Barataria, but in the Terrebonne Basin. Uh, and we've done that since the late 90s. And now the idea is to move us into a more, okay, as we go back and feed these areas of shoreline, how do we, again, do that so that it has the, uh, the, the, the highest impact for the longest period of time for the cheapest amount of money? And with that, I'll, I'll just leave that if there's any questions. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Awesome update. I love the line of we're overpowering, outpacing land loss with the projects that we're building. And I've told this story many, many times after Hurricane Ida when we were flying over uh, Terrebonne and we got over Trinity East. Um, the governor came on the headset and he's like, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. And um, it was just really refreshing to see some of those recently completed projects prove to be sustainable. And that proved to be the case for our barrier islands. And uh, we did have some impacts on West Bell Headland and West Grand Terre, but um, the projects that had been completed construction uh, performed beautifully and proved to be sustainable. So it was refreshing to see. Appreciate the great uh, work and the update. Do we have any questions for Darren? Uh, Councilman Dean. Thank you. Uh, it, Darren, this is awesome. I, I, I picked up on the same line that Chip did and actually saw the same thing. You know, right after the storm, we flew and things looked so much better than, than we, we were anticipating they would. Um, a question I have, and we've talked about this some time, even though you do get beat up a little bit sometime from time to storms, having moved that, sh that sand from shoal the shoals where it's out of play into the literal currents, are you seeing any, you know, a loss somewhere becomes a gain somewhere else? Like we're not losing the sand completely. It's it's actually just moving around a little bit. And, and I wanted you to maybe talk to that since we've had, we've gotten beat up a little bit and it's come back in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, you know, again, I, uh, this is what I we try to show with this this particular slide. So, you know, we, we do the, the restoration in these various stretches along the shoreline at, at slightly different times. And again, we can we can dramatically move the shoreline outward. Um, but but what you see post construction for a period is that some of these areas, even though we're not adding sand, uh, those areas are continuing to accrete a shoreline. And, and part of what what you see here is that, you know, the sand in this region moves from from east to west. Uh, based on the currents and the wave dynamics. But, you know, basically this, this section of shoreline is not really accreting that much, 
uh, it's, it's kind of holding its own, but as the sand moves down, it's continuing these other sections to continue to accrete. And, and that's, you know, what we constantly say is that just because the sand is not in the same configuration, we put it right after construction, doesn't mean it's washed away, doesn't mean it's gone. Um, you know, it's benefiting the system through, through the long term. Again, you know, this is how bear islands function. They form through erosional processes. You don't have barrier islands where you have a, a river building a new delta, right? So, you know, the way barrier islands form is erosion has to happen. And so even though that sand's being moved, that sand's being moved through the system and benefiting that system. And that's part of, again, going forward, looking at where you put that sand now more judiciously so that it benefits the system for a longer period of time. It just seems like we're, we're reaching that critical mass, having done enough across the coast to where, like you said, we're overpowering things. We've got sand that came from way offshore. It's now it maybe moving a little right. back and forth, but it is right. still maintaining everything. And I think a couple more years of this, and we're going to be in really good shape. Yeah, I mean, we have to admit that, again, the way the system works, eventually that sand will make it out of the system, right? But, um, you know, it, it still has the ability, based on placement and how you place it and where you place it, having the greatest impact for the longest period of time. Okay. You know, th things like we started building marshes out of sand b behind Bear Islands. Now we've gone to more muds and clays. Now we're going back to a little bit more sand. And, and part of that is learning these lessons of as it erodes, if, if your whole back marsh is made out of mud, your sediment budget, the amount of sand in the system reduces because now you don't have that sand being uh, uh, you know, released into the, into the to flow. So again, all of those things are tweaking how we're doing these, these designs and these restorations. But you know, part of that is all, again, going back to, yeah, we've touched on everything. We've sort of built all these dunes and, and high pieces of land. So now you know, what changes do we make as we go forward? Maybe we don't have to build all that high dune. Maybe we just have to put sand in the system and let it move. So, so is it typical that it moves from east to west? No. It, it depends on where you are on the coast. In some places it moves from west to east, some places it moves to east to west. No. So like in fact Caminata, there's what we call a nodal point where the way the waves come around the river, sticking out in the Gulf of Mexico and it bends the waves and the waves in the middle of Caminata push sand toward Grand Isle, push some towards ter Terrebonne. So again, it just depends on where you are. Uh, and then it switches back again when you get in this section of the coast where it starts to move east to west. So, you know, we see sand move east to west and we see it move west to east in this section and then we see it start moving west, uh, east to west again. It, it, it just, it's all based on the configuration of the waves and how they move. Thank you, Mr. Digo. Z, you good? And Bill? kind of asked the question I wanted to ask, but considering that, is there a way, knowing that there is going to be this literal drift, to feed the system that you may not necessarily, you know, have to use at the expense of an island to be able to introduce that sediment? Can we look at, and are we considering options to maybe just feeding the literal drift system? Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you look at West Bell Pass, you know, and, and again, it was heavily impacted by Ida, but, but even in the original design of that, we had what we call the feeder berm, where, you know, we know the sand in that section moves from, from, again, sort of east to west. And the idea was we're building that shoreline, but we're also putting a supply of sand in there that the waves will impact and move along that coast. Caminata is a perfect example of, you know, we did all this work. Uh, and made that continuous shoreline, and now you know we may be off, better off just going to that nodal point on a cyclical basis, and rather than spending a lot of money shaping and grading all of this sand with bulldozers and creating sort of the habitats that we needed, um, now we just put sand at that nodal point and let it go in both directions. Um, and you know it could potentially be much cheaper and much more economical to do that. You're saying you're considering that, or you're actually trying to. Or put a project together to do that? I'll just say we're, all I know is we're considering. Okay. Strongly considering? Strongly, strongly <laughs> considering. I'm strongly considering it uh, for what that's worth, Z. But uh, no, I, you know, I, again, I think um, when you look at the, the BISM program, which is, again, sort of making these structured decisions on now where do we go, where are our priorities, what is the data showing us is, is the most a uh, critical area to start supplementing and how's the best way to start supplementing it. 
I think that's where these things are going to get more nailed down. So, um, again, just as a as a, a, a example, you know, we went through this process in a in a very uh, sort of high level last year, where we started, you know, putting in what we thought were critical areas, and the areas that we thought were critical were, you know, uh, ended up being areas that other programs picked up and 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 started looking at, at projects. And so I think we'll continue that process and refine that process and come to a point where, you know, on some basis, shorter than a master plan basis, we will be putting these priority areas out there and what are the best approaches to do that. And I think, again, those approaches are going to be high on the consideration. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Lee? <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Darren, for being here today. Appreciate the update. Moving on to, I'm sorry, Mr. Hidalgo. Can I pass some information? You sure can. You. If you might want to pull that mic a little closer to you just so we can pick you up. Get out of your recliner. What's what? <laughs> now? It's on? Testing. Testing. I think, yeah, you're on. Well, you're okay. This is staff too, I think. Okay. okay. All right. Just to pass some information on. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Bush, I asked about that, that, uh, that product. You got it? Okay. It's, it, it's just for everybody's information. It's called IBS engineered products and it's distributed by North Western power equipment company and they store those uh, those uh, portable uh, bulkhead sections or, 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 or blocks store in safe uh, ISO containers. So they store it on site and, uh, and, and they're, they're, they are secure. Since it's aluminum, they have a lot of value to them, so they are secure in storage. It's a Black Friday sale. According Black to representatives, are right. They're not cheap. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you for the uh, for the information there, Mr. Hidalgo. So we're going to get uh, an update from Mr. Marlborough on the Bayou Lafouche Freshwater Pump Station. Just an exciting event uh, that happened just a few weeks ago with Ben and many uh, two members of our congressional delegation, the governor and uh, CPRA officials on this project. So. One that's been a long time coming. It's great to get an update from Ben. Welcome to the board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, my name is Ben Marlboro. I'm the executive director of the Bayou Lafouche Freshwater District. I'm here to give you an update um, specifically on the pump station, but, but really on the, on the entire Mississippi River reintroduction in the Bayou Lafouche project. Um, we'll talk about real quick who is the Freshwater District, obviously the history and significance of Bayou Lafouche. Um, a lot of familiar faces here, but also a lot of unfamiliar faces in the audience uh, who may not know the deep-rooted history of the Bayou. We'll get into the program implementation of what we've been working on uh, over the last several years, um, and then kind of a wrap-up towards the end. So first and foremost, who is the Freshwater Gist District? This is the geographical boundaries of the district. It is the west side of Ascension Parish, uh, the entirety of Assumption Parish, the entirety of Lafouche Parish and all of Terrebonne Parish. Um, this is Bayou Lafouche here that feeds off of the Mississippi River. This is the formation. We are a board of 12 board members. Uh, we were established in the legislature by in 1950, first and foremost, to provide fresh water to the water purifications along Bayou Lafouche, the facilities along Bayou Lafouche. Um, currently, we serve approximately uh, almost 10% of the state's population actually gets their drinking water from Bayou Lafouche. So it's extraordinarily critical from a drinking water standpoint. And then in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, there was a push, uh, and they actually modified our statutes and our authorizations to actually use Bayou Lafouche as a freshwater conveyance channel uh, to combat saltwater intrusion uh, for conservation and restoration. And that's really that mandate and that, that authority has really been a bulk of the work that, that we've been implementing. Of course, falling back, all of the improvements that we make uh, along Bayou Lafouche from a restoration standpoint obviously further protects and solidifies 
the drinking water source for so many people. So historical perspective, I think it's always really important. Some of you probably have already seen this to kind of go back to give everyone an, an idea of what happened to Bayou Lafourche and why we're doing what we're doing. So let me back up. So this is the Mississippi River here for everyone not familiar. This is the city of Donaldsonville. Uh, if you head this way on LA-1, this takes you towards Plaquemine and into Baton Rouge, and this takes you towards St. James going east. And this is obviously Bayou Lafourche here. So in the late 1800s, Bayou Lafourche used to naturally flow out of the Mississippi River. Uh, to put it into context, about 10 to 20,000 CFS cubic feet, of second per cubic feet per second of water used to naturally flow out of the Mississippi River into Bayou Lafourche. It was a main commerce corridor for the entire Bayou region, specifically to get their goods out of the entire region up into the river and over to New Orleans. Um, in the late 1800s, obviously, the, uh, the focus of, of transporting goods began to shift with the construction of a railroad crossing in 1873. Um, I'll leave this in here because this became a real focal point of our uh, uh, reintroduction efforts in the future. The original construction allowed for navigation of, of uh, marine traffic as well as train traffic uh, across Bayou Lafourche. Um, and this obviously shifted the focus off of Bayou Lafourche as a commerce corridor. Uh, so there was a lot of pressure to, uh, to do something, address the springtime floods for all of the residents and plantations along the bayou. So in 1904, um, the authorization uh, to temporarily close Bayou Lafourche came and the, and the closure was complete. The original intent was to construct a, 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 dam, a lock, sorry, a lock structure there but that never happened. Uh, the dam remained. In 1934, this is really important, there were some structural stability issues with the train bridge, so they built a, basically a levee across Bayou Lafourche with only a five by six box culvert to allow localized drainage. And then the Freshwater District was formed in 1950. The Department of Public Works built a pump station along the, Bayou, along the Mississippi River and added two nine-foot culverts through that levee embankment that crossed the bayou. Um, and this was basically the configuration of Bayou Lafourche from 1955 basically till 2010. Um, the existing pump station capacity was 450 cubic feet per second, and that's what we're pumping still today. So real quick, obviously, what are the long-term effects of damming off Bayou Lafourche? This will be a familiar slide to, to most. Um, the historical land change um, from 1932 to 2010. This is the, the doom and gloom map that no one likes to see. Um, this is the Terrebonne Basin, the Barataria. I can't even see my pointer. But Bayou Lafourche splits the Terrebonne Basin and the Barataria Basin. And the east side of Terrebonne Basin, the west side of Barataria Basin, seeing some of the largest land loss rates in the globe. And part of that was because of the damming off of Bayou Lafourche. And this kind of gives you more of a focalized um, graphic. So this is Bayou Lafourche from the Mississippi River out of the mouth of Port Fouchon. And when you cut the freshwater and sediment and nutrients off at the Mississippi River, you also cut off the flow of, of that water and nutrients and sediment of all these distributaries that used to feed off of Bayou Lafourche and help build this land. So as I stated in the, in the late, late 80s, early 90s, uh, there was a major push to tie Bayou Lafourche back to the Mississippi River to use it as a, as a restoration tool, as a conveyance channel for fresh water uh, to, to really combat saltwater intrusion. Um, that, that effort began in the early 90s. A project was formulated in, the, in, in 92, I believe, uh, in the early stages of the Quipper program. And from 1992 to 2006, it went through some rigorous studies, rigorous analysis, millions of dollars, a ton of people worked on it. And ultimately, the culmination of all that work was this report um, prepared for the Department of Natural Resources in March of 2006. And this was kind of our master plan that laid out the components to maximize the amount of fresh water that we could put into Bayou Lafourche to have the most impact on the estuaries in Lower Terrebonne and Lower Lafourche, but also not have major adverse impacts on um, 
the developments along and along Bayou Lafourche and near the adjacent area. And some of those major components were obviously um, modifications to our pumping capacity. So the, the report called for a minimum of a thousand cubic feet of second per, uh, cubic feet per second of flow. Our current capacity only had 450, so something had to be done there. I pointed out the railroad crossing. This is the railroad crossing in Donaldsonville. This was the linchpin of the project. We couldn't actually pass our existing um, pumping capacity through this, these culvert systems. So in order to expand that pumping capacity, something had to be addressed with that railroad crossing. Uh, there was a weir constructed in 1970 in the city of Thibodeau to uh, preserve water surface elevations for water plants and sugar mills. Um, there had, that structure itself had some damning effects and it called to be removed. Uh, of course, from 1904 to 2006, there were a lot of natural but mostly man-made processes that changed the actual cross-section of the bayou, uh, inhibiting its ability to convey additional fresh water. So a substantial amount of channel dredging had to be done approximately 30 miles from Donaldsonville down to Thibodeau, and then some strategically located water control structures had to be placed along the bayou, not only to be able to shut the channel off uh, for environmental events that brought in salt water, uh, but also in other events where our pumping capacity was actually reduced, we could close these structures off and create basically a reservoir in the bayou for the water plant. So that's a real quick history. Um, in 2010, that, that report was completed in 2006, kind of got put on the shelf. Uh, for a while, and then Hurricane Gustav came and was kind of the aha moment for the freshwater district in the state that we really needed to start implementing some of these programs and projects. Um, and, the, and the first project that we, we started implementing was the channel dredging, which was initiated uh, immediately after Hurricane Gustav uh, and went from um, Donaldsonville down to Belrose. Um, and then we extended that project down to uh, Napoleonville. This kind of just is, there's nothing really sexy or exciting about a, a channel dredging project. I saw someone from Weeks Marine here, so they probably get really excited about it. But the way we implement these projects is uh, we utilize neighboring agricultural fields. Um, and with the suction dredge, we dredge Bayou Lafourche, and, and we pump that material into the neighboring agricultural fields. Uh, and the farmers are really excited about it. To understand kind of how constricted that channel had gotten, this is that railroad crossing in Donaldsonville. Uh, this is Bayou Lafourche here. This is the size of the, uh, the channel before dredging was initiated. This is kind of during dredging. You can see some of the operations going on there. And then you can see kind of what the <coughs> channel cross section looked like or the channel section looked like post dredging. So greatly increasing the size of the channel and the ability to, to push more fresh water in there. This project, um, Union Pacific Railroad Crossing was, was really the linchpin in the entire program. Um, while not very big in size, not very big in cost, uh, relatively speaking, without addressing this issue just below, this is about a three quarters of a mile below downstream from our actual pump station. Without addressing this issue, then all of the rest of the program was for naught. If we couldn't, we couldn't pass our existing pump, pumping capacity through the previous drainage structure. So if we couldn't address this, then there was absolutely no need to expand our pumping capacity. This is what that structure, that crossing looked like before. This is actually looking downstream. Those are the two culverts that the Department of Public Works added, and that's the existing one that the, that the railroad put in the, in the 30s. This is kind of a more recent view. And then this is what it looked like post-construction. And to compare that view to what it looked like before. This is actually both looking upstream. So this project here li not literally and figuratively blew everything open for us. Now we can pass as much water as we needed. Uh, there was nothing stopping us except what has become our most limiting resource, which was money. So uh, we continue to push forward on implementing our other programs. This kind of gives everyone an idea of the size of that channel. This is just below that railroad crossing. Um, and this is that same area. This is where that picture was taken before. So um, this completely changed 
the, the function of the freshwater district. We were able to finally pump um, at full capacity and, um, and the bayou started to take on a, a transformation. What year was that done? That was completed with CAP dollars, and so it had to be, it literally was completed December 31st, 2016, um, with absolutely no time to spare before the CAP dollars expired. Um, so on go, also with CAP dollars, and I'll get to the funding scenarios afterwards, but we, we uh, constructed a saltwater control structure in Lockport. This was actually a structure that was placed further south in 2002. We continued to lose the battle to saltwater intrusion, so we made an initiative to move that structure further north, north, utilizing the existing structure that was there. We constructed a new receiving structure there in Bayou Lafouche. And one of the interesting things about this was when we moved it, we were using CAP dollars, so it had to be built in accordance with the overall project, so we modified the design to not only be able to utilize this structure to stop a saltwater event, so a salinity event with saltwater migrating north, but we actually modified the structure so that we could close it, sink the barge, and keep it in place to create a reservoir on the north side so that the, the uh, potable water facilities intake pumps don't cavitate, so it really protects the drinking water source for the people. This was kind of a similar project that we worked on up in Napoleonville. Um, obviously, you see the configuration of the gate is a little different. This structure doesn't have to be operated in a salinity event. If we have a salinity event in Napoleonville, we have some serious, serious issues. Um, but this is a structure that's actually utilized to protect the drinking water source for Assumption and Ascension Parish and then a sugar mill up in Belrose. And then the construction and completion of those two projects allowed us to remove the Thibodeau Weir, which was a big project, um, especially locally for, for a lot of the residents. This natural resource of Bayou Lafouche was kind of taken away from the residents uh, in 1970, and, um, and we were able to, to give that, that resource back to them. Um, and this has been a real big deal. We've actually gotten a lot more activity in the Bayou. Uh, a lot of recreation happened. This is kind of a before not kind of, it is a before picture, in 2020, and this is actually an after picture, not kind of an actual picture, in 2021 after the removal. Um, and then this is the exciting project. I know, I think this is what you actually asked me to give you an update on, so thank you, Chairman Fawn. The pump capacity improvements project, and, and I, I think it's important to, to, to give kind of a background of all the projects that we couldn't start this project without working so diligently and implementing the other pro projects that I just highlighted. This pump, this picture here shows the existing pump station, 450 cubic feet per second of water. Kind of gives you an idea of the, the size and scale of the new pump station that's actually constructed and designed for 1,500 cubic feet per second of water so that we have some built-in redundancy when this poor fella meets its maker. So this is kind of a flyover. Once again, I apologize. It's not kind of a flyover. It actually is a flyover that shows <laughs> the layout and configuration. That's Bayou Lafouche. This is, this is obviously the Mississippi River. Um, you know, the, the, the existing pump station was constructed in 1955 by the Department of Public Works, and, and it's done an incredible <laughs> job. I would, I would argue that it's probably far outlived its serviceable life. Um, it, the timing of this pump station couldn't be more appropriate. Um, obviously, you see some upgrades. We actually have truck access to the, to the pump station. Ms. Goodson, and following up from our meeting yesterday, these two pumps are what's not going to be included in the original construction. So this is probably a little clearer configuration. So it's six. It's six uh, 250 cubic feet per second pumps individually. Um, we began the design of this in 2015 when we saw that the railroad project was actually going to happen. Um, I put this picture for a couple reasons, um, not just to show how much weight I've gained since August of 2019, <laughs> but this was probably the last time I smiled um, from August 2019 when we signed the funding agreement with DEQ and CPRA, um, but I also put it to show 
the recent groundbreaking in 2000, I mean in October of 2022. When we were sitting at this table signing this, this funding agreement, which was, was an innovative funding scenario for this type of project, we utilized uh, DEQ's revolving loan fund um, to, to fund the construction of the project um, and, and servicing the debt on that loan. Uh, CPRA is sharing a large portion of that, and then the Freshwater District is picking up the remainder. But when we were sitting at that table signing that agreement, we thought we were 90, about 99% complete with the permitting and the design was done. And, and if you read the full press release, you'll see that we were anticipating going to construction uh, in the coming months, early that following year. And little did we know we were about to embark on uh, a two to two and a half year uh, permitting process wrap up as part of our 408 that deals, deals specifically with um, section 106 of section 404 of the section 408 permission, um, which specifically deals with the National Historic Preservation Act, okay? And um, this was one of the longest, most grueling and stressful processes that I've ever been through and hopefully never have to go through again. One of the things I probably need to update on my history is actually the building of Fort Butler. So Bayou Lafourche, when it naturally flowed out of the Mississippi River, uh, was the site of a historic Civil War uh, fort and battle. Um, and because of its presence there, it put us into this, this Section 106 uh, review, uh, in addition to historic downtown Donaldsonville. Um, there were both archeological issues that had to be navigated through, as well as what they refer to as the built environment, the actual view shed impacts of the construction of this new pump station, uh, mainly due to downtown Donaldsonville, but also because of this beautiful historic structure, which is our existing pump station. So um, one, of the, one of the leading, um, one, of the, one of the main issues in the um, Section 106 was dealing with the, the adverse impacts that the new pump station would have on the view shed of this pump station. So let me repeat that for everybody at home. So our new pump station is going to be constructed just here downstream of the existing pump station. And because this station is actually classified as an historic structure, the new pump station is going to have an adverse impact on the view shed so if you were standing here looking out, it would have an adverse impact on the view shed of this pump station, this structure. Um, and I know we're giggling and we're laughing. It wasn't a fun process. Um, two and a half years we went through this, navigating how to address the impacts of this and the archaeological components of the site. Um, and, and, I, and I don't... I got to be careful, but I, I, I certainly have an opportunity to have a mic, and I may never have an opportunity to say it again. Are we? That's absurd, okay? <laughs> it's absurd. It's not acceptable, and, and we shouldn't have to have gone through that process. Sorry. We should have had to go through that process. It's the law. It shouldn't have taken that long, okay? And, and with the time that it took for us to do that, that, that happy little picture of me, Chip, Brent, and, and Dr. Brown, we had $65 million, which we thought could cover the cost of that pump station. That delay pushed us past COVID, past Ida. When we opened bids at the beginning of this year, that, that same pump station was $96 million. $96 million. It took us 32 years to find $65 million to build a pump station, and we literally had 45 days to find $31 million to plug a gap for something that should not have taken that long, okay? Luckily, CPRA came to the table and helped us fill that gap. Freshwater District put up some money. And then, of course, Representative Zerang and the rest of our legislative delegation came up with a lion's share of that money. Um, obviously, Ms. Goodson was very involved in a lot of those conversations. And we were able to fill that gap in a short period of time um, to get that project started. And this is what I want to highlight. Two and a half years, okay, to negotiate a mitigation of that pump station, and this is what we're going to be required to build, okay, 
to offset. There's some additional components. We have to do some noise analysis. Um, we have to do some additional digging. But this is a lion's share of the mitigation that took two and a half years to come to, okay? And I bring this up mainly because this is not a freshwater day. We're past it. This is not a freshwater district issue. This is, this is a everyone issue going forward in this project. We have to get better. We have to get more efficient. Um, this attacks, you know, of, of all the projects that have been listed and talked about today and prior, we have a lot of, we're dealing with very limited resources, okay? I think we have a lot of fresh water. I think we have a lot of sediment. Those are, those are abundant resources. Our two most limiting resources in all of the work that this agency does is time and money. And processes like this attack both of those, okay? And we really can't afford to continue to burden these projects with these, these, these extreme costs um, when these agencies like ourselves are already, we already don't have enough money to complete the project. We're pulling components off. We're literally sitting there. We, we met with, with Ms. Goodson yesterday to try to figure out ways that we can add. We open bids and we have to yank components off of this project so we can afford to build it, okay? Because we, it took us two and a half years to negotiate this. And how much money are you spending on that, Ben? This, this right here is probably gonna cost us about $120,000. It's, it's a walkway. And look, I, I don't want to, I'm not insensitive to the historical significance of this, okay? That's not the point. The point is the urgency in, in getting these, these negotiations started, worked through, and completed, okay? You know, it's, I say negotiations, it's, it's not really a negotiation. You got to do what they're going to tell you to do anyway, so just tell me what to do. What well, I, we appreciate, to do. I appreciate your sensitivity to it, but in my mind, if you go and look where this this pump station, not where this mitigation efforts, but the actual pump station is located. No one in Donisonville is going to look at the old pump station on a, on a Sunday stroll. And for Ben to have to mitigate for a brand new pump station being put in front of a dilapidated pump station, and have to, it, it makes zero sense. So I know you're being careful. Um, but you're exactly right. The time that it took to go through this almost killed the whole project. Very close. Um, and so to be clear, these are not CPRA regulations. Correct. These are not CPRA guidelines that, that you're, you're referencing. But Ben is exactly correct that this is a coastwide issue from Morganza to the Gulf to Maripaw to Barataria to every single project that we are implementing, the timeline, time and money. And th these are projects that are not harming the environment, people. <laughs> we, we say this all the time. These are projects that are protecting the environment, that are sustaining the environment, that are restoring the environment, that are enhancing the environment. And we are being caught up by regulations and laws that are designed to do exactly that. And so when you talk about regulatory reform at the federal level that we continue to push to, for the federal government to look at these types of projects through a different lens, this look no further than Ben Malbrew and what he's experienced on this project. And so that applies to the Corps of Engineers. It applies to the federal family. It, it does apply to some entities in state government yep. um, that this board doesn't have anything to do with. But... Um, I just commend you for your persistence, Ben, because um, from the time it, we took this picture to the time to, to, for you to stand at this mic today is, in your words, absurd. Absurd, yeah. So I'm with you 100%. But and I'll never back down on that. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll say this before I move to the next. The next slide's kind of exciting. So while we're still doom and gloom. We're not done. That we're not done through this process. So, so we're actually being aggressive. And, and once the pump station is complete, we still have about 15 miles of channel dredging left to do. We've already initiated the permitting process for that, and and some of the same issues are starting to resurface again through that that permitting process. Specifically, um, as it relates to the uh, the disposal areas in the agricultural fields. So. The first 15 miles, we, we didn't have to, we didn't really have to do any uh, archaeological investigations 
um, on the disposal sites. And, and that's stuff that we're now being asked to do on sites that have been in agricultural for hundreds of years, okay? And it, it, it's frustrating, and, and the cost estimates, to be quite frank, it's gonna burden our dredging project, which we estimate is gonna cost about 35 to $40 million to do. It's gonna be, at minimum, an additional $2 million is what we're estimating this effort to cost. So we don't have $40 million right now to do the dredging. So we certainly don't have the $2 million to go and explore all these disposal sites to see what might be there, okay? And it's not a sense of, hey, we know something significant happened here. It's go out there, do some explorations, and tell us if something did happen there. So I just say that kind of not a sounding of the alarm, but I know there's a lot of talk about the, the feasibility study and effort that's about to start here. These are things that, that other agencies learn from what we just had to go through. Get out ahead of it. Get out in front of it. Do everything you can and, and join a board. Help us figure out how we can make sensible changes. We're not trying to circumvent the law. We're just trying to expedite it and be realistic and, and conscious about not burdening, burdening these restoration and protection projects with undue expense. And then this is, I think, my last slide. Um, this, is, this is really exciting for, for not just myself and my board, but, but a, lot of, a lot of people who worked extremely hard. I said it, our groundbreaking. You know, we get to stand at the mic and, and, and celebrate the construction of such a significant project, but we stand on the, soldiers, the shoulders of so many people uh, who helped lead the way, who worked so diligently going back to the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but this is an update of, sorry, this is a summary of the projects along Bayou Lafourche as part of the reintroduction of Bayou Lafourche uh, that have been implemented since 2010. And you look at that total project number of a, almost $170 million uh, through the completion of our pump station is, is, not, a, is not an insignificant number. And, and it, it's something that we're very proud of. We obviously certain, certainly couldn't have done it alone. We certainly couldn't have done it without the help of this board um, and CPRA. If you look at all of the uh, funding source breakdowns, you see CPRA, CPRA show up a lot. Obviously, the state legislature has been a, a champion along with us in a lot of these projects. But also, um, you know, the, the cooperation that we've worked so hard and gotten from our neighboring parishes, our neighboring municipalities, to get these projects moving forward uh, and implemented um, has been a, a major accomplishment for my board and, it, and it's something that we're very proud of. So thank you all for, for your support. And this is just kind of the, the last slide. This is, this is what Bayou Lafourche looked like before we started implementing these projects. And this was not long ago. We actually had a boat parade um, you know, we, down to Bayou, we just find any reason to throw a parade or a party. So we took the weir out, so we figured we'd throw a parade. Um, so just kind of gives you a visual, visualization of, of how implementing these projects and programs have, have really changed the, uh, the entire dynamic of Bayou Lafourche and that entire Bayou region. So we're bringing back the Bayou. And with that, I'll, I'll certainly take any questions I think when it warms up, I'm, I'm smelling a uh, tubing trip for board members down the bayou. Yes. If anybody wants to, wants to join. Um, just to put a finer point on what Ben was talking about, just the timeline. The, the first decision that Brent and I made when we were appointed to these positions was to fund that pump station. So we've been in these positions now, Brent, almost four years. So from the time that decision was made to now, even longer than, than two years. Um, but members and, and ladies and gentlemen, I'll just say that every single, single major milestone that Ben mentioned, from the railroad bridge construction to the saltwater structure to the weir removal to the pump station, has been done under Ben's leadership um, and under his reign as director of the Bayou Lafourche Freshwater District. And uh, Bayou Lafourche is much better off because of your leadership, Ben. So I hope you know that and uh, appreciate you being here and um, giving us a, a great update. I so, appreciate that. Yes, sir. Mr. Hidalgo. So, 
So, Ben, is this working? Yes, sir. I can hear you. You can hear me. <laughs> so, does this include the final dredging or does not? No, include? sir. No, it sir. does not. So, no, you sir. still have another 40 15 miles. Well, that's if we don't find any if you don't artifacts. Yeah. Okay. 40 million. Which I don't expect. So but this just brings you through the pump. The completion station, of the pump station. But not the Correct. Improvements. For so the, the full. That's why I say y'all are almost completely done with me uh, in the freshwater district altogether. We have one more. We can't start the dredge. The, the last phase of channel dredging until the new pump station is operational, because of water surface elevation issues for the water plants. He's going to work himself out of a job. Bill. <laughs> Gladly. <laughs> All right, uh, Representative Zarang, sorry. Not to mention the environmental benefits you were talking about that impact or should have been considered, but you, the fact that over 400,000 people depend on this for potable water in the industry, which is ridiculous. So I guess what you're saying, it's not kind of like absurd, it's absolutely absurd is what yes, you're sir. saying. Yes, sir. I understand. My question in the dredging that was completed and what you're doing now, you've increased the capacity somewhat, right? Correct. You were able to do that. Correct. And one of the issues was sedimentation at, fr uh, near the pump site. Are you seeing any of that with the, uh, the new dredging and the increased pumping capacity? <clears throat> yeah, so in the, in the original design of the dredging cross-section, there was actually, as I stated from the beginning, that the, the aim of this project as a, from a restoration standpoint is not a land, it's not a land building diversion, right? So it's strictly a freshwater diversion that's gonna combat saltwater intrusion uh, and hope to preserve and conserve what's there and what we hope to build by other means and methods. Um, so in the original construction of the, the dredging cross section, we actually constructed a sediment trap right there on the south side of the railroad bridge where we dug the bayou deeper and wider for uh, I think 1,200 feet. And the intent of that is to trap a majority of that sediment. So the heavier stuff that would, would we, we slow it down a little bit so it settles out there and we can handle a majority of our sedimentation issues right there in the first mile. And what we do is, is every five or six years, we will bring in a, uh, you know, a, a small suction dredge, dredge that area and actually pump it back into the river. We would love to use it for obviously other uses. It's just, it's, it's 80 miles away from where it actually needs to be. Mm -hmm. but, but you're even having issues, even if you couldn't deposit it on farmland, is what you're saying, you have to resuspend, put it back into the river? Is well, we, do, we resuspend it, we, we dredge it and pump it back in the mm -hmm. river for, on that particular instance because there's not a lot of available farmland to deposit nearby. Farmland. As you go further south, there's an abundance of farmland. There's actually uh, thousands of acres that the farmers are, are literally knocking on the door. Uh, asking for the material to, to, because it enhances some of their substandard uh, agricultural fields. That's where we are dumping the, the bulk of the material or all of the material into the adjacent farmland. Okay. Thank you. And great job. Appreciate what you I do. appreciate it. Thank you for everything. Yep. All right. Any other questions for Ben? All right, Benjo, thanks for being here. Thank you, and, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. All right, members, we're going to get an update uh, from two of our federal partners, um, Emily Thornton with NOAA and Miss Mary Josie Blanchard with the Department of Interior. I'm also going to call up uh, Mr. Mel Landry at this time to get an update on the Gulf Corps and Tribal Youth Conservation Corps. I know that uh, Mel is going to, I believe, introduce Emily, but before Miss Mary Josie comes up, I... Um, I'm going to read her introduction here, but just, just make note, members, that these are two agencies that are very involved in the uh, TIG that have oversight of the BP oil spill restoration dollars, and they are actually, both of these agencies, NOAA and Interior, are lead on two of the largest marsh creation projects that we have underway right now in southeast Louisiana. Uh, NOAA is leading the Barataria Marsh Creation Project, and the Department of Interior is leading the Breton uh, restoration. So just want to thank them for their, their collaboration. Mel uh, obviously has been very involved in uh, BP oil, sp oil spill settlement discussions and funding from, from Barataria and all the other projects uh, representing NOAA 
and just want to just want to thank them for their, their coordination, their collaboration, their sense of partnership. But um, I know you're going to introduce Emily, I think, uh, Mel, but just real quickly on Mayor Josie. So Ms. Blanchard is the director of Gulf of Mexico Restoration uh, from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the office of the Assistant Secretary of Policy Management and Budget. She has received Interior's Distinguished and Meritorious Service Medals. She was previously served as Deputy Director of the Office of Environmental Policy and Compliance and Assi Assistant Director of the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. She received her BA and MA from the University of Texas. Hmm. <laughs> Hook them horns, huh? And her AA from Stevens College. Mary Josie enjoys playing the flute and gardening in her spare time. I don't know if you brought your flute today, but we'd, we'd love a little jingle if you got one. <laughs> Uh, but appreciate you, Mary Josie. You're going to follow uh, Emily here at the presentation, but I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Landry. Thanks. Thanks, Chip. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm Mel Landry uh, with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here in Louisiana, where I lead Deepwater Horizon Restoration for NOAA in the state. I had the great fortune of growing up on Louisiana's coast. I went to an amazing school in St. Bernard Parish, uh, and I spent my weekends at our family camp down in Hopedale with my grandfather. I was able to study fisheries at LSU. And since then, I've been working to restore our natural resources, first at the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, then at the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program, where I had the great fortune of, of working on that project we just heard about for a while. And then for the last 12 years at NOAA. Uh, and that blessing, uh, it started with Chase and Specs with my grandfather down in Hopedale. Uh, but in order to grow our restoration economy, we need to provide the opportunities that I had to those who aren't as fortunate. We need to spark interest in bright young men and women so that they learn there are opportunities to have a rewarding career at here, at home, restoring our coast. In 2016, the very first Restore Funding Priority list included the Gulf of Mexico Habitat Restoration via Conservation Corps Partnership. That became the Gulf Coast uh, Conservation Program, the Conservation Corps Program, also known as the Gulf Corps, and the Tribal Youth Conservation Program. These programs give others the great opportunities that I had. Not everyone can have a camp in Hopedale or a grandfather who is the mentor like I had. Through recruitment, training, field work, and mentorship, we are building the restoration workforce of the future. What you see on the screen are just a few highlights of the success of the Gulf Corps Program. We are restoring hope while we're restoring habitat. Those member year and project of the year accolades are given to a single person or a single project throughout the core network in the entire United States. Not only are we doing great work, but we're doing it better than anyone else right here in Louisiana. As Chip mentioned, behind me are Mary Josie Blanchard, the Department of Interior, and Emily Thornton and the core network. They'll provide an overview of the two conservation core efforts here in Louisiana. While they're presenting, think about where our traveling field crews could support conservation in your community. I want to thank you for your time and your support on these important efforts. Emily? Hello. Uh, as Mel mentioned, I'm Emily. I work with the CORE Network. So a little bit about Gulf CORE. The aim is to restore the habitats damaged by the Deepwater uh, Horizon oil spill while also restoring the economy across the Gulf states, doing that by paying and training local young adults. Um, so they get hands-on skills training, lots of workforce development skills, um, and we have a huge focus on job placement. So the way it works, uh, funded by the Restore Council, um, administered by NOAA, and then managed and led by the Nature Conservancy, in partnership with the Core Network and Student Conservation Association. Now on the ground, it is implemented up there in the left-hand corner. You'll see the Conservation Corps organizations. It's implemented by those organizations who recruit and train the members for the crews. And those yellow dots are project locations. So this is just some of the activities the crews do. Um, anything from invasive species removal, living shoreline creation, um, all the way to prescribed fire, things like education and outreach even, just to get the public more involved. They do anything that improves public land. Um, and so they learn a lot of skills. These are the specific Louisiana metrics for Gulf Corps, 2017 to 21. 
You can see that over 2,000 acres have been impacted. Um, almost 10,000 paid training hours have gone to the local young adults here. Um, things like wetland enhancement, upland enhancement. And just to focus on a couple of projects, we'll look at one in the east and the west. The first one is the Big Branch Marsh Stewardship Project. So this was very ecological based. Um, this was a four year project. One of the really great things they did here, one of their big focuses, was the red cockaded woodpecker nest protection. So they find these clusters of trees, they clear um, a pretty large radius around these trees so that then prescribed burns can come in, clear that forest, um, make sure it's healthy, and while protecting these nests of these endangered species. And then in Sam Houston Jones State Park, they did debris removal and also accessibility, um, public access to the park in 2019. And then getting into a little bit of the disaster recovery that the crews do, um, they did go in after Hurricane Laura and offset massive tree damage by planting 3,500 longleaf pines. Um, and one of the things that really sets Gulf Corps apart is the training that these members get. This is top-notch training. Things like S212, S13190, these are globally recognized certifications that you almost have to work with a federal agency to be able to get. So Gulf Corps is offering um, these trainings to members. They get things like GPS and monitoring techniques. Um, that's becoming very prevalent today. Uh, first aid certifications with CPR. And then one of the last things I'll mention about the training is the workforce development. So this is what the core network leads. Um, this is very unique. It's extremely um, tailored to each member. So they each do their own unique portfolio that they work on throughout their term. And then they have that to go out and find a job after their term. Um, they, we do mock interviews with them. We do active listening skills training with them, communication. Um, they have a very professional resume by the time they're done with this program. And then our goal, job placement. So our workforce development, as it adapts and changes as needed, um, has been very successful. So overall, we have an 88% job placement rate. So that's 203 out of 230 graduates in Louisiana. That's 25 out of 31 graduates. And these are just some of the positions they've gotten. Um, it's really amazing. We've seen some years over 90% job placement. So the workforce development has shown really successful. And this is just a quick example of success in Louisiana. Jasmine was on a crew and she was named 2019 Corps member. <coughs> Once again, uh, as Mel mentioned, that's across the US. Um, and she was named that Corps member of the year. She then went on to do a summer internship at Senator Bill Cassidy's office in DC before returning for a second term. Um, and you can read her quote here. Uh, I will say that when I managed Louisiana Conservation Corps, I got to see firsthand lives change. Um, the trajectory of people's lives, their knowledge base, their skills base, their confidence level um, to see these people come in unsure of themselves and walk out ready to get a job, ready to accomplish things because they have that confidence. They have the skills um, and now they're ready for opportunity. And just lastly, I'll show some Louisiana project locations. And if you know anyone manages land here in Louisiana and there's work that needs to be done as there always is, please reach out. We have an extremely successful program and we are always looking for work. Thank you. All right, thank you, Emily. Any questions for Emily before we transition over to? How long is the term? A term is an average of 10 months. So some of them are 11 months, some of them nine. What now? How old? Oh, it's age. the average is 18 to 24. So usually around 20, I guess, would be the average, but we're looking for 18 to 24. Okay. 
Any other questions? All right. Well, Ms. Mayor Josie, if you'll come forward, please. Thank you, Emily, for the update. Great information. Well, I've got to say there's a lot going on in Louisiana. And no surprise to the people in this room, but it's really an impressive uh, a lot of things that have been occurring. I do have some Louisiana roots. It's always good to return to uh, the area where I came to see my grandmother every summer and, and then also listen to a lot of LSU football games because my dad um, was an LSU graduate. So not to let you know that it's all UT. <laughs> so anyway, I've thoroughly enjoyed working with the people in Louisiana. They've been great. Um, you know, and both in Restore and in NERDA. And so that's been a real advantage. And thank you, um, Chairman Klein, for um, having me here today. I'm so pleased to be able to meet with you and be able to talk about our uh, Tribal Youth Conservation Corps. And unlike the, the one that was just discussed with NOAA, they were paired together. We are actually um, deal with high school students. And so, and these are done by the tribes and, and you know, the tribes design their own uh, programs on this. Um, we take the responsibilities of tribal um, responsibilities of government to government consultation, as well as supporting the tribe's desire to live in, in harmony with nature and sustainability. And at the same time, we think it's very important that the tribe be able to develop their own programs that meet the unique needs and culture. Uh, the tribes have great programs for their participating high school students. The programs concentrate on skill building and youth education for natural resources, and we think it's um, very beneficial use of the Restore funds. And so we certainly thank um, the um, <clears throat> well chip in particular for voting for this. <laughs> so. Um, the tribal program was approved by the Restore Council members in the first funded priorities list. Um, five tribes took place, as you can see up there. The only Louisiana tribe at that point was the Chittimacha. Um, the initial program provides, and current program, 50000 a year to each tribe, and the activities are extended from the first FPL were extended for three summers. So you tell we're, we're talking very small in terms of the amount of money that's been thrown around here today in the millions and billions. Um, the tribes defined their own programs. They made sure that it involved high school students, as I mentioned, that they're hired as interns and that the work involves community projects and natural resource education. Um, the first tribe, uh, um, the, we'll first talk about the Chittimacha. Every one of the tribes developed engaging and successful programs. Each program highlighted some of the natural environment and cultural traditions. Um, so what did the students of the Chidamacha work on? Uh, this slide shows a wheelchair um, accessible path by the students that leads to the landing at Biotech. You probably know where Biotech is. It runs along the tribe's reservation and is west of the Atchafalaya. Biotech has cultural and historic significance uh, for the tribe. Um, because of its snake-like shape, and it was um, named after a legendary snake that was fought by the Chittimacha. In another example of the Chittimacha, uh, the students worked on a project of the cultivation of river cane, and this is a native bamboo that the Chittimacha used to, uh, for their traditional baskets. And so they relocated river cane um, from where it was growing on private property to an area uh, where it could serve more as a resource. And the resident gave permission for this to occur. And as you know, the um, Louisiana is not known for its cold summers. So it was hot out there. And uh, they have it, these plants have extensive root systems and heavy clumps that can um, create new plants. So they transplanted this river cane. It was put to good use and subsequently made to, to baskets. Uh, another example of what the Chittimacha learned was the tribal education which dealt with river cleanup. And basically they learned the importance of their drinking water um, in the Atchafalaya and Biotech. Uh, the river intake system of Biotech is, is pictured here on the, on the 
uh, the slide, and it's a way to protect and respect these resources. Uh, they collected trash from the riverbanks and also the open water. There was also another um, Louisiana tribe and um, that was able to come in when we were asking for extended money. We worked with the uh, Cushata to be able to add uh, them to these list. And after the uh, FPL program was approved, um, they were more than willing to fill out all the paperwork to be a grantee. As you can see in the picture, this is Holly Beach in Cameron P Parish was hard hit in August of 2020. Um, and basically, this is an area um, that the Cushata want to be able to do a reveg project in the future, but they've gotten a much slower start given COVID and everything else. So, but they are they are starting to work. Um, the there was a special project that they did work on. The tribe was able to partner with USDA to get a lot of uh, good information from the Soil and Water Conservation Gulf. Coast um, Soil and Water Conservation Authority provided its expertise on natural resources. And they learned about coastal erosion, uh, the importance of shorebird nesting habitat, um, and also native and dune um, and beach restoration cultivation techniques. And this knowledge was able to be uh, employed in their restoration and reveg along Rutherford Beach in Creole. They actually planted 4,000 plants in one day. Um, and that's a good example of what they learned to be able to do. There are three different species that they have learned, uh, were able to plant. And as you can see on this slide, <clears throat> the Proud Cushata tribe, um, our members uh, were very excited about what they were able to accomplish. And they have, were able to help reduce coastal erosion and provide valuable nesting habitat for shorebirds. Um, the, um, just to give you a summary of the project, the youth could participate in restoration, um, but it also educated them. Uh, there were five tribes in, um, initially with the Chittimacha and the Cushata joined when we asked for the extending funding. Um, basically, the outcomes are the improvements in the Gulf Coast tribal communities, um, conservation and employment experiences for the tribal youth and tribal youth education, not only in natural resources, but also in the cultural heritage. We're very pleased with the opportunities for the tribal youth in this program. Um, given the uh, nearness uh, newness of this program. The graduates are just beginning to be able to either study in college for those that go on or be able to uh, go forward in terms of job pursuits. We've heard that tribal members say they consider this one of the most important projects that they've been able to um, go forward in and they seem really pleased about it. Um, Louisiana has been a leader in not only deep water restoration, but in also contributing to natural and cultural resources education. And we appreciate what it's been able to do in terms of its tribal member youth. Um, we want to, I want to thank Chip and Bryn and Chris Barnes and Brian Lancina and Mari Chatelier for all their support. And thank you very much. Yep, thank you, uh, Mary Josie. I, I remember in the in the early days of the Restore Council under the initial FPL, I think is where this was first included. And um, I know everyone doesn't have the, uh, we'll call it a privilege of serving on the Restore Council and hearing some of those uh, discussions. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different ideas. There's a lot of different projects, a lot of different initiatives that are discussed in those meetings. And uh, it, it's just really refreshing to see all of those long, hard discussions actually result in pictures of, of things being done um, with the funding that was, was put in place for this effort. So just commend you and your continued uh, push uh, for this at the Department of Interior. So thank you oh, for, thank for, for you everything. And, and Mary Jo, look, as I said in her bio, she is leading Interior's efforts for uh, the entire Gulf of Mexico restoration. And so uh, she is heavily involved in a lot of other things just uh, in besides this, but um, just appreciate a great update from, from you and the department, as well as uh, Noah from um, Mel and, and Emily. So yeah. thank you. Any, any questions for Mayor Josie on this? And I love this program, so I'm happy to spend the time to talk about it.
Very good. Just some questions. Okay. Well, thank okay. you for the update. And uh, let's see here. Also, just should give a shout out to staff, as uh, Mary Josie just mentioned, Brian, but uh, Chris Barnes and uh, Mari uh, Chatelier in our office are very instrumental in the restore funding and all BP uh, settlement efforts. So thank you all as well. Uh, moving on, last agenda item of the day, as always, is uh, we're going to get a federal update from our good buddy, Neil McMillan. Do not go yet. If you recall at the last board meeting in St. Bernard, I may have slipped in a slide. Uh, Neil is an Ole Miss graduate, so I slipped in a Go Tiger slide into his presentation. So a couple things have happened since that last yeah, board meeting. We, is that we helped y'all get to Atlanta. Yeah, you have not been recognized yet, sir. So LSU beat Ole Miss. LSU beat Alabama. Alabama beat Ole Miss. So uh, Neil, welcome back to the board meeting. Just want everybody to know that Neil had a birthday on Monday. And... Um, I mess with Neil because I really like the guy, and uh, he does he does a really really good job representing CPRA and the Governor's Coastal Office in D.C. with all of the federal uh, efforts that we have underway. So welcome back to the board meeting, Mr. McMillan. Thanks now, for that. Now you may proceed. At least we could beat Auburn. So <laughs> <laughs> that was something. Well, great. Well, uh, before I get into what I hope is a, a fast and positive update on the Rise Act. Um, last night, Governor Edwards released an executive order uh, marking the one-year anniversary of the infrastructure bill passing, as well as detailing a commitment to help get um, greater access to small businesses, minority businesses, women-run, veteran-owned, dis disadvantaged businesses, as well as working with community partners. And so I'd love to work with Inger to send you all that press release and that initiative. And I'm confident that CPRA, we've already been in lots of discussions on that. So that's a good good thing. And then another thing that's kind of surrounding these RISE Act discussions are how we use these dollars to help local communities, especially disadvantaged areas. So it was great seeing President Cooper show how a parish lays them out. But also um, these master plan meetings or conversations, whether formal or informal, we've been able to point to that as something built in that uh, allows lots of input, um, which is a, a good way, a good thing that um, not all Gamesa states uh, have in place. So, um, kind of cool how we're using um, what y'all put into process to uh, ab advocate for our legislation. So, we'll ha highlight a couple things on how it supports building and then also the, the score and what that could mean for the RISE Act. Um, have this slide just to remind folks that we have a Senate and House version. And I'm focused on the RISE Act today because that's where the significant interest is. On the Gamesa side, it removes the cap. Uh, we have a, and then we also start up something with offshore wind, um, more details there. That should be very familiar. Um, we got the House version introduced, that's HR 9094. And what I want to point out is that we've added a bunch of co-sponsors this week once they return from um, their midterm recess. So we're bringing in greater um, input from Texas, California, South Carolina, and Virginia. So those are um, beyond just our Go Mesa states, you'll see this map, the widespread support, both uh, including interior states for the RISE Act. This kind of combines the House and Senate efforts. So you're really seeing that it's uh, becoming a national program, a bipartisan um, or a national um, effort on this with bipartisan support. So that's positive. We also got some um, renewed stakeholder engagement as we push for um, passage that's in the year and I originally entitled this environmental stakeholders but when you break it down you actually see there's industry stakeholders from the wind and the ocean um, energy industry those um, that association you see the land and water conservation fund groups with the national parks and the city parks alliance as well as uh, you know our good partners in the environmental groups with restore the Mississippi River Delta National Wildlife Federation uh, National Audubon Society and EDF, who really spearheaded this effort. So um, that's that's a strong showing at, when offices get letters like that, which was sent to leadership. Um, you know, they, they know it's not just an environmental thing, but it's something that with broad support. So that's positive. And then you also see another map showing kind of the offshore wind states, particularly in the eastern seaboard, have also been weighing in, and we're trying to get more governors to... Uh, Engaged. We're, uh, Just to point out, Neil, those those entities that are listed on that slide were not on the Coastal Act previous 
bill that was attached to the Great American Outdoors Act that are now issuing letters of support for the RISE Act. Yes, there's a point being that the momentum behind this legislation is growing, not just from a state, not just from industry or from your, your typical cast of characters, but also from the environmental community as well. That's right. We didn't want to put forward a usual suspects letter that um, if you only have like, you know, if you have under 10, that's that's kind of a weak letter. But 20 is, is very strong. Um, we're pleased to see that. And we also really appreciative of the Lower Ninth Ward Center for Engage Sustainable Engagement and Development, um, which really kind of showing that this has a local impact. And that was a, a significant get. And we want to continue to work with all sorts of groups on how Gomesa can help um, our full full range of uh, Louisiana communities. So that's that's positive, and um, I, I think it was it's well received, and we're using it to uh, get people to you know up this on their priority list. So that's kind of some of the emergency support, but we also got a score, um, which is a great sign that we are in the game of uh, passing this year. The Congressional Budget Office gets um, hundreds and hundreds of requests for what's the financial impact to the federal treasury from this legislation. They prioritize stuff based off leadership um, interest. And so Chairman Manchin asked for a score. The congressional leadership affirmed that this was something they were considering and they needed to know. And as you'll see in the bottom right corner, um, the budget analysts determined that as of November 7th, this would be an $11.6 billion impact to the treasury. So that's our, our score. Now that's um, that's obviously a big bill that shows why we need so much effort, and it's kind of a hard thing to do. You usually want to reduce your score or eliminate it entirely, but for something like revenue sharing, which um, basically every dollar that's that's moved is, is scored because uh, it leaves the treasury and goes to the states, um, it's going to have something. So we always knew there was a score, but then you want the legislation you agreed to that can pass to have a high financial impact. So we don't want the score to be 500 million because then we negotiated away um, all the advantage. So it's uh, there's pros and cons to it, but we're, um, I guess, pleased that our estimates that we got from Dr. Stephen Barnes are pretty close to, um, uh, pretty close to what we've been working with. So it wasn't a terrible surprise. Um, in fact, I'll go into a few reasons why this could uh, further underscore some urgency. So this chart is the the fiscal year, year by year breakdown of the 10 years. And I circled three key points. Uh, I'll start with the bottom one. And it's, it's very small, um, except for that one. But um, it's the offshore wind revenue in 2023. And this is a $2.2 billion opportunity for the wind states, particularly because of the very expensive New York, New Jersey wind lease sale that the RISE Act folds into um, by starting in January 1st, 2022. So this is a very high, uh, large portion of their whole score, like almost half of it over 10 years. Um, and so the Wednesday have seen this and there's like a renewed um, urgency to get that in instead of having that pass behind. It's also helpful because the wind states now realize this is the lowest score they're ever gonna get for this provision because California is gonna have a wind sale next month uh, folks are anticipating that could be a billion, billion and a half, maybe even two, even with the deep water because of the political interest in that. So there's um, kind of like our Gomesa side, we realize this is as small as it's going to be score-wise. The wind states are getting a renewed urgency too, which um, certainly helps. But is, isn't that, Neil, and sorry if, you, if you're going to say this, isn't that because on the wind lease sale, the majority of the revenue is going to be up front? on the actual bonus bids, on the, on the lease sale itself. And so was, as opposed to Go Mesa on the oil and gas revenue sharing, more of the revenue comes from the actual royalty from the or the production side of oil and gas production. And so j just thinking through this is, as I mentioned in, in the first agenda item, is that if we have a lease sale in June of 2023, next year, how incredible would it be to have this bill passed by the end of the year during the lame duck to where the, the state is positioned to receive revenue sharing from the lease sale that will occur in June of 23. So 
I'm sure that there's rules and regs that have to be promulgated by federal agencies, but if this is the law of the land, correct me if I'm wrong, in December, there would be revenue sharing for that lease sale in June? Um, that's correct. It would go in immediately into effect, and basically the Department of Interior would have to uh, come up with a way to measure the distance to the coastal shoreline and divvy it up similar to the way they do GOMESA. So it's seen that that's uh, largely a GIS and um, math question, so that should be accomplished. So if it um, happens in a fiscal year, the following fiscal year, we'd expect to see it dispersed. And um, that's a good point, too, on the upfront cost, which is uh, something we've, we've emphasized because folks are not proposing to um, put a royalty tax onto the megawatts generated from wind. It's really about securing, uh, bidding to secure the top site. That's the really lucrative part of it. And, um, and so that's, that is a difference in why wind um, needs to be kind of taken at the very front end um, because they're auctioning off the best spots first. And so people want to um, get rolling with that. And then on the um, the top line is the oil and gas GOMESA eligible estimates. And on the left-hand side, what I circle is that there is a score next year um, from removing the cap. And so what that means is that the Congressional Budget Office realizes that we're hitting the cap next year. And as you see, from henceforth. So if we can get this provision done this year, we avoid the situation of having the cap limiting our percentage. So this would be wonderful logical timing of removing the cap. And so that's, that's uh, something we're trying to emphasize with the other Gomez states that um, this will start hitting us next year if, if you don't go all in. And then I circle on the far right hand side, kind of 2032, which is when our you know, restore dollars go away. It looks like the cap would be worth, the cap removal would be worth about 1.4 billion for the four Gulf states. So, um, you know, if we maintain it, 40, 44% of that, it, uh, as, as in Louisiana, that would make up a big, a big part of that. And then you've, you've probably already seen this um, score per source uh, chart in green. Um, Gomesa State's writ large would be about $5 billion from this cap removal. Um, and that's, that's obviously shared out for Louisiana. The math kind of equals out to about 2.2, 2.1 billion over 10 years, which is a little higher than we anticipated. Um, sequestration will take a little bit out of that, but um, it was good to see that was largely consistent. And we're breaking out the Land and Water Conservation Fund because we don't want people to erroneously assume that we're taking that as well. We want to show that that's going to the other states, and then um, you, know, you see the rest of the numbers. So. I guess one of the big takeaways is that this is very timely from a wind, from a Gamesa um, a point of view, and still very valuable, which is uh, great to see uh, confirmation. And then I guess to further underscore that this cap removal needs to happen right now is Department of Interior released a press release this month saying that uh, 21 billion in fiscal year 22 dollars were shared, which kind of shows the the benefits of revenue sharing from the rising prices, you know, the West Texas intermediate kind of range between 70 to $114 over this, this year per barrel. And you see circled is the Gamesa offshore, uh, 924 million um, is the overall point of view and they'll work and analyze and divvy it up over the next few months. But you see like we're only 76 million away from the cap there and that's without leasing. You know, that is just from production and higher prices as well as the rents. So um, if they renew the leasing as the Inflation Reduction Act um, kind of directs them to, and we're getting production and, um, you know, if prices stay in the similar ballpark, the cap is uh, going to matter from here henceforth. So, um, you know, it seems like it's all coming together and hopefully we uh, are able to be successful. And uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. All right, Neil, thank you. Um, we're just so close on this. And so, you know, I'm just looking at this board. I mean, we've got Mr. Scott Burke, who obviously represents a particular basin on the board, but he's a member of the West Bank Industrial Association. 
West Bank Business and Industry Association. Those are the types of entities that we need to have putting pressure. And I'm just using you as an example, Scott. I'm not just calling out WBIA. But other organizations that are across South Louisiana, across the Gulf, we have got to keep the pressure on between now and the end of the year for this. And so as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, this is our first time in St. Tammany. So, Renee, I'm looking at you. If there are rotary clubs or chambers of commerce or any other entities, associations here that can get in this game to make calls to Cassidy, to Kennedy, to there's a companion bill uh, in, in the House that um, several other coastal members are sponsoring. We, ju we just can't let up. So there's a, there's a revenue sharing coalition that was established at the state level that's, that's Gulf Coast. We've expanded our reach into other coastal states across the country, but we, we've got to keep our foot on the throttle on this thing. And so engagement from the ground up, from the grassroots level is, is certainly gonna help for this. So Renee, I would just lean on you and any, any entities here that we could get letters of support or calls to the congressional delegation. If anybody has relationships with legislators or congressmen, congresswomen in Texas, Obviously, their, their delegation is huge and, and can uh, move the needle on this. We would just ask your continued involvement on this effort. Great. Um, and, and to that point, uh, we can provide draft letters, talking points, uh, contacts, emails, you know, what have you. It's, there's been a lot of work here, and uh, so we could, if you got the idea, we could turn it on pretty fast. Yep, because a good portion of these dollars go to local parishes as well, not just to the state. Um, thank you, Neil. Always very good updates. Keep uh, the pressure on on all fronts and look forward to future updates from you. Uh, members, I do not have any public comment cards at this time. Is there anybody in the public that would like to address the board, make a brief public comment? No? Nope. Uh, members, I'm being told that I believe there's lunch in the, in the side room for, for members if you want to grab a lunch before you, before you leave. But... Um, Last board meeting of the year, members, I want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving, a Merry Christmas, and a happy holidays, and uh, enjoy some time with friends and family over the coming months. And we'll see you back here, or uh, somewhere, I guess in Baton Rouge, uh, in January. We so we are adjourned. And Mr. Hidalgo, you can take that chair. Mr. Cooper said it's fine with him. <laughs>